Okay, well, we have uh, a lot of talks to get through this morning. Thanks to everybody uh, joining us uh, online and in person here. We've had a great summer with the interns um, here in Berkeley and also with uh, interns joining us remotely um, from the Sardinia Radio Telescope, three interns over there and three interns uh, working at Trinity College Dublin, in addition to uh, one intern who has been working at Oxford University under the umbrella of um, the Oxford Summer Program, um, working with me and Chris Lintot. Uh, we're very grateful as ever to the sponsorship of the Breakthrough Initiatives and also to the National Science Foundation who fund the program here in Berkeley. And I'm glad to see uh, Dr. Pete Warden who's also joined us this morning. And uh, Pete, I, uh, if you'd like to say a few words, please uh, go ahead. Well, yeah, it, you know, thanks. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm really delighted that uh, this program seems to be such a big success this summer. Uh, and, and by the way, I'm greeting you from uh, Trier, Germany today. So uh, the uh, it's uh, late in the afternoon. So uh, good afternoon. Uh, but uh, the the Breakthrough Listen program is is the uh, uh, you know the, the probably the the best known and the and the most advanced effort of the Breakthrough Initiatives. Uh, our objectives are, as you probably all know, is the search for life in the universe, and and probably one of the most interesting aspects of that is are there other civilizations uh, especially techno uh, civilizations and uh, the, the listen program for the last eight years has done a spectacular job of increasing uh, the attention to this as well as scientific uh, uh, attention increased as well uh, I'm, I'm really delighted to see the students here and uh, you know we're, we're sort of hoping that uh, some of you will have caught in the bug and uh, we'll continue in your career to, to work in, in uh, uh, the space sciences, astrophysics, and particularly uh, the, uh, the techno signature area. And uh, we look forward to, to seeing you uh, frequently in the future. And uh, uh, you're now all on our list of, uh, of people to be uh, included in some of our future meetings, such as the Breakthrough Discuss Conference. I think some of you were able to go to that uh, this year. Uh, but uh, but uh, we, we hope to see you, more of you in the future. Uh, with that, uh, over to you folks. And again, congratulations on a, on a job well done. Thanks very much, Pete. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, we're also joined here by Jamie Drew um, in the room um, from Breakthrough Initiatives. Uh, Jamie, do you want to say it? Uh, yeah, no. Uh, I think I met most of some of you during the uh, Discuss conference, uh, of course, and uh, that was quite a, quite a fun event. And I've heard a few stories about the work you've been up to but I really by the way you guys should all be honored uh, mr drew has had a haircut i can see that, that I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> my boss likes the military style so i decided to keep it extra short for you this time general <laughs> I, I, yeah. <laughs> but um yeah looking forward to seeing the presentations and uh looking good colonel looking good sorry i'm a minute late <laughs> no worries thanks jamie and thanks pete um, so we're going to start off um, with a pre-recorded talk um, from one of our interns in Ireland, um, Charlie Ash, who unfortunately uh, couldn't be here in person. Uh, I'm going to share this from my screen, and hopefully the audio is going to come through here, but uh, if you could let me know. Um, how are we going to do this? Yes, great. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Charlie Ash. Uh, I'm a Trinity College student about to go into my third year of a physics degree. And uh, this summer, I've been working under Professor Evan Key and researching and processing pulsar data, specifically rotating radio transients or ORATs for short. I'm sure everyone already knows what a pulsar is. Here we go. Um, highly magnetized, rotating neutron star, but maybe not everyone remembers what an ORAT is. So I'll show you right now. Bam. Um, these are all artistic interpretations. Unfortunately, or rats are not rats in space, as much as I would really like that to be true. Um, but despite not being rats in space, they're really important. So or rat, as I've said, stands for rotating radio transient, but they're really just uh, very sporadic pulsars. Uh, so the radio emission patterns are irregular and very unpredictable. And because they're so intermittent, it makes them a lot more difficult to detect. Uh, for example, the fast Fourier transform usually won't pick up on an aura. Um, so not only are they difficult to detect, that is only when they are actually detectable. So a lot of the time when you can uh, observe an aura, uh, you might see nothing. Um, you might catch them for a few minutes, hours, even maybe days. Uh, but then they disappear, they're gone. 
and there's nothing in the data that even suggests that they ever existed. Uh, and then they come back. So you kind of have to get lucky with your observation times. However, uh, observing more rats is very important because at the moment, we don't really have a concrete understanding of pulsar evolution or pulsar physics. Um, the more we understand about outliers like all rats and other pulsars that behave atypically, the more we understand about pulsars as a whole and how they work and why they behave the way they do. But to understand all rats and the why, we need to understand, well, the what. So what is happening when the rare or rats go radio silent? Well, that question is sort of the basis for my summer project because we kind of don't know. Or do we? Uh, I buried the lead a bit here because for a really long time, we really genuinely didn't know. But in June of this year, literally two months ago, a paper was published where FAST was used to observe uh, the ORAT J1913 plus 1330, which is a mouthful to say, and I will be saying it more. Um, so I've typed the link here. And uh, obviously, because this is a video, you guys can't copy paste it. So you'll have to individually copy that. And I apologize. Um, so using their findings over an observation time of 10 hours, I believe it was, and the highly sensitive nature of FAST, they observed this aura, um, that this aura underwent extreme post-to-post -post modulation, uh, which told us that the reason core rats go and observe for these periods of time isn't because they go radio silent, it's because our equipment isn't sensitive enough to observe them at certain frequencies, and they change frequency a lot. So, of course, then, the question of the summer is, is LOFAR sensitive enough to detect this aura? Uh, LOFAR is special. Uh, because sort of in the name, it operates at much lower frequencies than most radio telescopes. And being able to observe J1913 plus 1330 with LOFAR would be fantastic for a few reasons. The telescope time uh, is <laughs> difficult to get. And observing or rats takes a lot of time and look. And the more time, the less look you need. Uh, so on top of that, LOFAR observing at lower frequencies would allow us to possibly catch uh, the post-to-post -post modulation at lower frequencies, which would confirm the results of the paper. So let's talk about the work involved with that. So we were able to get one hour with ILOFAR to observe uh, J1913 J1913 plus 1330, which in terms of ORATs is not very long. As I've said, ORATs are sporadic, and the more time you stare at them, the less look you need to catch them. Still, we can hold out hope. So I've been processing this data using Scott Ransom's Presto. Presto is made for finding pulsars, and it's got some really great tools that are very vital to finding our aura. But as with any research, there have been pitfalls regardless. So firstly, or if I find, Radio frequency interference is the disease and plight of radio astronomy. And while Presto's RFI find does a great job of making a mass to get rid of a lot of it, it can't get rid of it all, which has been an issue. So then we also have PrEP subband. Uh, PrEP subband de-disperses data and prevents a lot of smearing as a result, which greatly improves our ability to detect single pulses, um, which is how we find ORATs. So it outputs the data into high resolution time series at specific DMs, which we can use the next really important Presto script on, single pulse search.py. So single pulse, uh, single pulse search pi does exactly what it says on the tin. It searches for single purses, pulses, not purses. There are no purses in space that we know of. So it searches for single pulses and it does it really well. So it allows us to make time versus uh, dispersion measure plots of single pulses, which allows us to see if our orbit has been detected. Um, it also gives us plots like this. Uh, so as you can see, this doesn't look amazing. Um, the problem with J1913 plus 1330 is that it has a relatively high dispersion measure compared to other ORATs in our Milky Way, about 175 parsecs per centimeter cube. And the higher the, uh, the dispersion measure, the more it's pulses get smeared. I mentioned this before that um, PrEP subband kind of prevents this, uh, but the higher the DM or the dispersion measure, the more subbands it needs to recover the pulses. But the more subbands, the bigger the volume of the data. So there's a certain trade-off that has to be made between them. That is a tough sweet spot to find. Now, I know what you're trying to say. Did you find J1913 plus 1330? Well, unfortunately, as of making this recording, I'm not finished processing the data due to some external issues. But 
hopefully when I get the results, we might see something. Uh, so I guess we'll kind of be relying on Irish Oak for that. Uh, but despite not having, you know, results, I hope the explanation of or rats and what I've been up to was at least a little bit interesting. So thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to hearing everybody else's. All right, great. Thanks, Charlie. So, uh, well, <laughs> I guess I guess you could post them in Slack. So, Evan Keen. Oh, okay. Maybe I'll just ask as well. So I was just curious about um, mold latency observations of RX. Mm -hmm. So it's super common now to. Everyone's going to have some kind of wide band observation uh, from C band and L band. Uh, apparently, the RX spectra are very steep. Um, mm -hmm. So, detecting them at high frequency is a bit of a challenge. It's not, okay. it's not similar to the regular folks. So, they have no uh, detection. So, very few have been detected at high frequency. Interesting. I think 88 was kind of fun. Yeah, it well, looks like Evan's online as well. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, are there, Evan, you'd like to weigh in? <laughs> Maybe you caught the question. <laughs> I only partially caught it. I'm here with my boss. <laughs> um, I think that that answer was that pretty much covered it. Thanks. Very great. Thanks, Evan. Okay, um, let's move on. Uh, our first in person speaker is Oliver Blackman from Dartmouth. Dartmouth. All right, uh, morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Calder. I'm a rising senior at Dartmouth College studying pure math. Uh, this summer, I've been working with Dr. Prop here, Professor Davenport up at Washington, as well as Chris Lynn Todd over at Oxford. Uh, and I was tasked with answering the, uh, the rather broad but interesting question of, of where are they? Um, and that has become modeling the detectability of engineered interstellar objects within our solar system. Uh, so, why are we interested in uh, interstellar objects? Well, in the past few years, we've detected um, for the first time, two interstellar objects in our solar system, um, Oumuamua in 2017, and then a little bit later, Borisov. Um, and Oumuamua was really abnormal, so it, it, it stirred a lot of interest. Borisov looked more like a normal comet, um, but, it was all, but both objects are, are um, massively different than anything we've ever seen before. So we find this like new area where we're interested in interstellar objects. Um, and there's also kind of a, a philosophical um, motivation for studying this, which is the heart to work conjecture. One answer to the Fermi paradox uh, which the conjecture says that there does not exist evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence in the solar system. Thus, there does not exist extraterrestrial intelligence anywhere. Um, I disagree with the argument, but it raises an interesting question. Uh, so where are they is, is a broad question. Um, and the kind of first thing I need to do is was formulate a more specific research question that gave me, gave me some goals. Um, and after going through some literature and playing around with some you know, initial coding, uh, I came up with the question of, of what physical and or orbital characteristics would place the strongest constraints on the observability of an engineered interstellar object in the solar system. So physical constraints could be diameter, could be albedo, orbital constraints um, really are gonna be those, ultimately will be those six kind of Keplerian orbital elements. Um, and, and my approach to answering this question was just to develop um, a hard-coded model of it um, from kind of first principles. Uh, so I, I came up with this solar system model. I think I'm currently on solar system 5.2, um, but I'm sure the number will continue to increase. Um, so yeah, the idea of the model is to predict the detectability of an engineered interstellar object. Um, and kind of not to go too deep into it, but the basic idea is, you know, given a body somewhere out there that you, you populate with some characteristics, how much light is incident to that body? Um, and then based on where that body is, what is the phase angle relative to your observer, which you instantiate? Um, so then that applies a phase factor. And then um, what is the emergent light? Uh, how much of that emergent light makes it to your observer? Uh, and then is this bright enough to see? Um, 
I went for, again, not to go too deep into coding, but I, I took an OOP approach, which handles some things really well uh, and does really poorly in other areas. Um, yeah, it needs to get faster. Um, and then the, the right chart is, you can't really see it. it not really supposed to see it, but it just, <laughs> it just demonstrates all the output options. Um, there are a lot, a lot of routines to code. So what does this look like? Uh, I've put up a sample output here, um, which is just one of many options as you saw. And this is this little video is looking at a two, 2D grid, um, which is across the orbital plane of the, the solar system, um, 11 AU across either way. Um, it's been populated with a grid of objects with diameter one kilometer and albedo 0.06. Uh, and the objects are every 10,000 kilometers, uh, which, which sounds pretty huge, but um, if you start increasing that number, things get really, really calculation intensive. Um, and you know, to make a nice video, you only need about um, every 10,000. Uh, and then all the calculations were done in, in Pansar's G-band. Um, the idea of this simulation is that it handles um, the bands from various telescopes and then ultimately um, should handle some some custom bands. So if you input the, the profile of the band, um, then it will it will do its calculations in that band. Uh, I apologize, there is no um, key on this plot as of now, but at the end of the video, it will show up. <laughs> Matplotlib just simply doesn't allow you to put it there at the start. Um, so what you're looking at is, is the first five planets orbiting around the sun. Um, my observer here is, is based on Earth. The observer here is pan stars. So you have an area cut out in between where phase angle approximation is four and or you're just looking at the sun. Um, and then here, this is uh, calculating apparent magnitude. So there's kind of your, your heat map of apparent magnitudes as you, as you go out in the solar system. Uh, and again, one of the one of the main goals of this was to do a parameter study. Um, and I, I hesitate to call this a parameter study, but an early you know parameter consideration, looking at diameter albedo um, with with kind of a, a low resolution is what I what I ran through in the past week. Um, and so all these plots on the on the y axis have the the number of bodies that meet a certain cutoff. Um, and I'll talk to what cut those cutoffs are. Uh, and then the the x axis is either diameter albedo. Or both. Um, so on the, on the far left, um, you see these single uh, curves plotted, um, the top one being um, the number of bodies detected versus the diameter, so kind of a linear shape, um, which initially kind of surprised me. And then on the bottom, you see um, the number of bodies detected versus albedo. Uh, and this was that kind of an arbitrary cutoff that was, you know, absolute apparent magnitude 23, which sits right, with, right, in, right within the range of like LSST. Uh, and I, I was kind of a little interested in the shape. Uh, so I went ahead and plotted. Um, this curve across a variety of, of cutoffs. Um, and so you, you see that you get a, a, a different shape. Um, and then ultimately in this in this right plot, I've just overlaid uh, those curves for magnitude 22 to 25. Um, what does this mean? Uh, it means that the, the parameter that is most, um, which has the strongest effect on the detectability of your object changes kind of based on the magnitude you're looking at. So if you're looking at magnitude, say 22 here, the effect that diameter has is, is somewhat linear. But if you bump it all the way up to magnitude 25, the effect that diameter has is non-linear. Um, so kind of an interesting initial conclusion. Uh, I, I kept saying I'd have these kind of one-liner conclusions to put out. Um, and I think this was my favorite one is, you know, if there was a, a one kilometer object with a relatively low albedo sitting within the Trojan population, which is um, Jupiter's L, Four point a five a five point one of the Jupiter's Lagrange points. Would we be able to see it? Um, and here's a, a run of the model. Kind of the dot would go green if we could see it. Uh, so my conclusion is is no, we would not see it. Um, kind of a bit. It just goes on. Uh, yeah. So some initial conclusions uh, and, and future directions. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. So the conclusions right now are not hugely quantitative. Um, but, but one, um, I would say that uh, you know, current observational capabilities and the surveys that we have done um, really do not place a strong constraint on the existence of an interstellar object within the solar system. Um, we need to look a lot harder if we want to come up with a, an answer to whether there's something in our solar system, uh, too, and there's, there's a lot of room to grow in, in our understanding of uh, small bodies in the solar system. Um, in the future, uh, things need to get faster so I can add a lot more parameters and a lot, go in much higher resolution. 
Uh, I want to expand this parameter space. Obviously, the conclusions I put up there were just for diameter and albedo. Um, and you know, the goal would be to, to integrate all of the Keplerian orbital elements in, uh, and then just increase the adapt adaptability. Um, I would, my ultimate goal will be to put out a conclusion that is um, a constraint on number density of engineered interstellar objects within a certain area in the solar system based on the, um, the, the confidence we have in our existing surveys. Uh, if you're interested in the code, dial up on my GitHub, please check it out and let me know if you have any questions. Let's go. <laughs> Um, if folks in the room have questions, uh, could you speak up for folks online? And if folks online have questions, please unmute. Andrew. Um, I had two questions. First, thing, thanks for a great talk. So, first of all, I'm sorry if I missed it, but what is the like fundamental way that you're distinguishing between engineered interstellar objects and natural interstellar objects? At this point, it's not. There's not a switch in singular activity that says you know engineered, not engineered. Um, it's just that the goal of the project is, okay. is to look for engineers. So for the moment, we're just talking about interstellar objects. Yeah. Okay. And then my other question is like, what what is the model? I'm just curious that you have in your mind for engineered interstellar objects in the solar system? Are they like under power? Are they broken? Are they like what is their purpose? That is that is that is a great question. Um, I personally, I really like the idea of the von Neumann probe, it's like self replicating mm -hmm. probe. Like grown out from civilization. Um, right now in the model, uh, I look at ideal diffuse reflecting spheres. Um, there are a lot of assumptions currently, uh, but the idea would be to, to kind of move to more complex geometries ultimately. Uh, but I don't know what the spaceships look like. So, um, we'll yeah. get on a little bit later to a talk from Brian Rogers on outliers within the solar system. Yeah, no, I, I like it. I mean, I, it's, it's really cool. And I like that it's very generic. I'm just wondering like, you know, these things come in and we have to detect it this way. It's because they're not electromagnetically communicative. They're not like sending out any coherent electromagnetic radiation. They're, you know, obviously not like coming to visit us. You know, they're not landing, you know, because we're fine. Nope. So, so like, what are they doing here? I guess. What's their purpose? It's a great question. Um, I think we had the talk that discussed about kind of relics floating through space. So perhaps that. Yeah. Or um, yeah, I don't think it's crazy that something might not be transmitting. If it's so far from its, I mean, if we're really stretching, if there's an object so far from its, you know, home civilization, there's no point to it transmitting back. It would take so long. It just operates independently. It's happened to the process. Makes sense to me. Cool. Thank you. Um, maybe it's not a comment. I want to speak about. Can you speak video. up, Michelle? Sorry. Speak loudly so folks online oh, can hear. Okay. So my question is related to the size uh, estimation that you basically demonstrated. I mean, there are millions of sort of asteroids that we have detected, which are about kilometer size between Mars and Jupiter. Um, how, how is it possible not to do it if, 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 if for example, if it's an interstellar object, it's of similar size? What exactly is your question? Are you saying that, saying that how would we the not size detect itself? It? Is that the constraint that you would be able to put in, or is it the distance from the sun that's more than the factor? I mean, I mean, part of the models is an input parameter is, is diameter. So the size of the objects is a consideration. Um, but we have detected one kilometer that, million that, of them already. Yeah, uh, we have a population of those that we've seen. Um, the, the question ultimately here will be given like, this kind of goes into what Brian's doing. Um, what is the weird stuff that would stand out from like what we've seen and how would that look to us in the model right so admittedly the things i'm populating right now like an albedo 0.06 and one kilometer object that's probably that's out there somewhere we've detected something that looks like that the idea of the model will be to take these objects that are kind of well a to get an idea of what is going to show up really obviously and then b to take to take things that might look really bizarre, like what would be a true outlier that seems really unnatural, and then plug that in and see when and how we could detect that. Okay, unfortunately, we need to move on. Um, you know, I'd encourage folks to ask questions on Slack as well that can be picked up maybe later um, in, in terms of that discussion, but we're gonna move on to another online uh, presentation from Rory Camping from Trinity College, Trinity College Dublin. Hi everyone, can you all hear me okay? Give me two seconds and I'll set this up.
Okay, can you all see that? Okay. Sorry, can you, can you see that? Okay. Yep, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Hi, right, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Rory. Um, I'm just finished my final year of theoretical physics in Trinity College Dublin. And for the past ten weeks, I've been working with Evan Keane and his PhD student Owen Johnson towards a techno signature search using Nenofar. Uh, so just as a bit of background, um, what exactly is Nenofar? So Nenofar is um, one of the low fire stations um, in the, the, low, the low frequency array uh, that spans across Europe. Um, it itself can be uh, a part of, it can be used in, in conjunction with the other low fire stations um, as, a, as a big telescope, or it can just be used as its own telescope uh, with a frequency range of uh, 10 to around 85 megahertz. Um, I've been focusing a lot on the angular resolution of um, these pointings by Nenofar. So basically, just to quickly go over some of the maths, uh, loosely speaking, in the frequency range that we care about, um, the angular resolution or the full width half maximum is inversely proportional to the frequency of the observations. And so then naturally, when you have a low frequency, your field of view is quite large. Uh, usually, this is not good. You want to be accurate when you can. However, uh, in the case of uh, ET searches, we can actually exploit this to conduct SETI um, on a large, uh, on an extensive list of sources. So if we can you know, find out, um, if we can figure out all the different sources that are within the field of view of one pointing, we can you know, either rule them out in the case of we don't find any techno signatures, uh, or we can you know, deduce that a techno signature could be coming from one of these sources. Um, so yes, like I was saying, that's mo mainly what I've been focusing on recently. So. Um, uh, in last year, when Owen was in Nancy in France, he conducted uh, 281 observations using Nenofar of um, TESS exoplanets. Um, the frequency range of these searches was between 39.8 and 67.7 megahertz, uh, which corresponds to um, a maximum uh, field of view radius of 0.54 degrees. Um, and so, um, and then uh, the minimum field of view radius is 0.3. Uh, 32 degrees. So anything within 0.32 degrees uh, could be searched across the entire frequency range. Um, and this picture here is just an example of uh, one of the pointings. And um, so you can see uh, the color uh, just corresponds to basically its separation from uh, the center of the pointing. Um, and uh, all the little dots are is just an individual uh, source obtained from the Gaia database, which I'll get onto now in a second. Um, so yeah, in total, uh, over 4 million um, sources from the third release of the Gaia database um, were found. Uh, however, obviously not all of these were um, uh, considered in this. So basically we reduced this to just around 870,000 unique sources uh, based on just, um, uh, not necessarily arbitrary, but based on um, error thresholds that we placed um, when considering distance and its actual coordinate in the sky. And so here, this picture here is just uh, a picture of all the pointings uh, on an ATOF projection, uh, and the color um, just shows the number of sources that are contained within in each in, within each pointing. Um, yeah, so basically, um, so yeah, there are eight hundred seventy thousand sources, but not all of them. Like I was saying, not all of them can actually be searched across the entire frequency range. So any of them that were within 0.32 degrees of separation from the center uh, can be searched. So that's within the field of view of 67, um, 67 megahertz, um, uh, but but if, if the separation is larger than that, then uh, there's the upper bound of the frequency range uh, depends on its separation, basically. So points closer to the edge will only be searchable within a very small uh, frequency range. Um, the median separation of all the sources uh, from the center of the pointings was about 0.31 degrees and uh, median, uh, median distance from Earth of uh, 1,200 parsecs. And so here are just some uh, graphs of uh, showing the distributions of sources. So up here we have this uh, red dashed line here corresponds to basically the, um, the, the, the smallest field of view radius. So anything to the left of this uh, can be searched across the entire frequency range and anything to the right uh, can, only be searched, uh, can only be searched up to a frequency uh, given by this black line here. Uh, the top plot just represents the uh, histogram of the separations and the bottom is just accumulate, a cumulative distribution of the separations. And the bottom right here, we have um, a, a distance uh, distribution. So the left column, uh, oops, sorry, one second. Uh, the left column here is uh, all the sources that can be searched within the entire frequency range. 
Um, and the right is just all of the sources, regardless of what frequency range they can be searched for. Uh, so for the work, so obviously we didn't, uh, I didn't mention any technical signature searches exactly, and that's because uh, there was a bit of an issue. So it took me a while to actually get access to the server on the Nancy station uh, with all of the data on it. Um, and then after that, there was a bit of an issue that we ran into with the filter bank files where the signal to noise ratio just exploded to like 100 million or just sometimes just spat out infinity. Um, and that was something that we were unfortunately not be able to resolve in time uh, for the end of this project. Uh, however, um, the actual analysis uh, and search for technical signatures is not that difficult. It's just a matter of um, specifying some parameters like the maximum drift rate, uh, the minimum drift rate, the, signal, the minimum signal to noise ratio, et cetera. Uh, and they're basically just running it through these pipe, pipelines like TurboSETI to search for Docker drifts or Spandak to uh, search for uh, FRBs or pulsars, et cetera. Um, yeah, so that's my quick and brief talk. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Thanks, Rory. Questions? Any questions from anyone online? <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer that, to be honest. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry if I missed it, but what were the um like the sort of parameters of the of the SETI light analysis? Like what's the frequency resolution of your data products? Um yeah, so um not 100 percent sure if this is reliable because the filter bank uh, files weren't there, I was supposed corrupted. Um I think the frequency uh, the Oh, I don't, I don't have the resolution off the top of my head. Um, I think it was on the order of a few hertz, I believe. I'd have to double check. So, so I ask because spectral broadening actually becomes pretty important at these very, very low frequencies. And, um, you know, whereas like for, you know, L-band observations and above the solar impact parameter, the distance that the star is from the sun isn't particularly important. It is very important for low frequencies because I would imagine that like, like at solar impact parameters less than probably like a hundred, like a hundred solar radii away from the sun, like the spectral broadening at these frequencies due to the interplanetary medium is probably like a border like tens of hertz, which would you know broaden the signal out quite a lot. So it would be worth I think like doing this calculation for these like just in terms of like the theory of like very low frequency SETI, uh, so that you know sort of. You know what the expected broadening is and so you might think oh well spectral broadening is bad because then you know i can't channelize such high resolution but um if i some of you probably read brian Brzezicki's paper um the the cool thing is that if it should be broadened that much if it's going through the ipm then you can use it as a discriminant against interference in other words like if you're if you're observing in a solar impact parameter of like 100 right and you expect that the spectral broadening from the ipm would be I don't know, let's say 25 hertz or whatever, but you have three hertz resolution, then anything that like you detect that's like you know narrower than the expected spectral broadening from the IBM is like obviously interference. Yeah, there's a customer of mine is working on it actually from the source side. So his planet is rotating around the star and the signal kind of transits beyond the planet because beyond the star, it's like an end of star. You would see it, it goes up to like a hundred hertz, mm -hmm. and then as the star kind of moves away from the solar radius, it goes down to it. So you can actually see the variation at the rate of discrimination. So I, I see uh, Jim's hand up online, but I think unfortunately we're going to have to move on just in the interest of time. Um, sorry, but please again post your questions in Slack, folks, if um, <laughs> if you have them. Okay, so next up is uh, Karen Chescon from uh, Trieste. Yes, correct. Nah. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so yeah, I'm Karin. I'm a second year. No, bordello, pizza tonda. Pizza tonda, no. Not the tempo. Um, is this me? No. I don't think so. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm Karin. I'm a second year master student in Italy, uh, in Trieste specifically, and I've been working the past two months from Sardinia. 
And as you can see, my project was about uh, searching for radio transients, so specifically FRBs, so fast radio bursts, in a breakthrough lesson data from the GBT telescope and specifically a sample of nearby galaxies. And to do so, to this analysis, uh, I've been writing a custom pipeline to use Spandac, the Spandac software, and uh, some ML classifier to find these uh, pulse candidates. So the first step was to retrieve the full list of the files to be processed, because um, we needed the on-pointing, so the galaxy observations, and the high time resolution files, since we're interested in um, FRBs, which are transient, evolve in a few millisecond scale, time scale. Um, so first thing, I had to write a script to retrieve all these files with their main characteristics, so target coordinates, uh, observation dates, and stuff. Um, the data right, set Karen. I've been... Karen, yeah. uh, do, you, uh, do you have slides that you're you're showing? Oh, not yeah. Um, so, oh, yeah. sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought okay. it was uh, showing them, but uh, can you see them now? Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Okay, sorry. I, I thought it was seeing, saying, yeah, sorry. Oh, my bad. Um, so yeah, the data, set, the data set I've been working on was uh, from the BL uh, sample of nearby galaxies, uh, so 97 uh, galaxies with declination above uh, minus 20 degrees, and it was a complete set comprising all morphological types, so I've been uh, observing like elliptical galaxies, spiral ones, and so on. Uh, other parameters of the data sets uh, I've been working on are, of course, the frequency range, uh, which went uh, from uh, below one gigahertz to more than 11 gigahertz. And uh, the files had a time resolution of uh, 350 microseconds, which allows the, um, let's say in principle, it allows the um, analysis of a uh, few millisecond uh, timescale events. Uh, the files were recorded, uh, the observation were recorded in files which represented subbands with 187 bandwidth, uh, which were then processed. So all this step was to retrieve the 15,000 and more files. Then uh, I had to get acquainted with the data and the software to use. So I've been using Spandac, as I said before, uh, to find these uh, pulse candidates. And uh, Spanda can also be used with uh, RFI mitigation features and ML classifiers to evaluate the candidates according to the likelihood, let's say, of them being actual burst candidates, like astrophysical ones. Um, yeah, so then uh, I had to, uh, let's say, uh, perform some analysis with Spandac to um, see what to expect in the case of a real uh, burst record being recorded. And uh, in doing so, I also carried out some tests about the parameters which were more suitable for the pipeline to use next. Uh, and also, I've been actually testing two ML classifiers because uh, there were lots and lots of candidates being generated and highly evaluated with the regular Spandex uh, ML classifiers. So I've been also trying to use Fetch, which is another one. Uh, next was to actually write the pipeline. So uh, the files need uh, first came into the H5 format and needed to be first converted to the filter bank one with uh, H5 to fill from the BlimPy package. Then they needed to be downsampled to 8-bit and this was done with Digifill. And last, uh, uh, they were ready and we could run Spandac on them. And it was decided uh, not to use any like cleaner like spectral cryptosis or other stuff, but uh, only to use RFI find and the ML classifier. Here also are shown some of the parameters that were chosen for the pipeline. Um, in the last week, since lots and lots of candidates were generated, like in the order of 10,000 plus, uh, I had to focus on a subset to perform a complete analysis of some of the files. So I chose 20 observation of 20 different galaxies. Uh, the, the list of the targets is shown on the right here if you're interested. And uh, I also chose a specific uh, frequency range, which ranged uh, from 1.6 to 3.1 gigahertz. And this subset of the files 
uh, was like all the files were processed, of course, and all these ones where uh, the candidates generated have been visually inspected and the interesting ones were saved for a further analysis, which was performed like by reporting the the candidate with tailored parameters to enhance the signal of interest. Uh, so to conclude, um, in the project, I uh, managed to process all the files, but uh, the candidates were too many to be inspected. So I focused on this subset of files. Um, as you can see also, uh, the number of candidates um, which were generated depended uh, greatly on the uh, frequency band and lots of like let's say weird other files were found and some of them were producing lots of candidates that were highly evaluated by the ML classifiers as uh, astrophysical candidates. Um, in the end, unfortunately, no actual, let's say credible astrophysical burst was found, but this project could of course be continued because there are still lots of candidates that need to be inspected if, <laughs> if there is a time to. And uh, of course, even in the case of not finding any interesting astrophysical candidates, this could, could still uh, pose uh, interesting constraints on the power and rate of the FRBs in the observed galaxies. Um, moreover, of course, all these candidates that were generated and the ML processing could also be used in like to train again or to train new ML classifiers in order to improve the evaluation of the candidates. So to inspect only the, uh, let's say, um, likely ones. So I'm happy this was all. I'm happy if you have any questions to take any questions or to Slack me if you need. Thanks, Karen. Questions? Andrew. Um, thank you for a great talk. Uh, so there have not been very many FRB searches carried out at frequencies above two gigahertz, but there, I, I guess there have been a few. And I was just wondering if you have any kind of qualitative sense of the how constraining your search will be ultimately relative to other searches that have been done. In other words, like will it be the most stringent limits on the population, on the high frequency population of FRBs? Um, so actually, I don't, I, I'm not sure. So uh, as far as I understood, like from my supervisor, actually, uh, yeah, not many uh, searches were done in this frequency range, oh, at least above 10 or around 10 gigahertz. I'm not sure even if there was something already published, I'm not sure, honestly. Uh, and But yes, there are lots of like technical difficulties because this pulses like should be like, not really huge dispersed. So you need very tiny, like uh, very high frequency, like uh, time, sorry, uh, time resolution, which actually we didn't really have because uh, like 350 microseconds. Uh, we did some like calculations like uh, out, on, out of box and it was made probably like not enough to see something like which wasn't really uh, a huge burst, let's say. So this survey is more constraining for the local universe because we are targeting hundred nearby galaxies, uh -huh. and most of the FRBs that we have discovered they are in like galaxies that are more further out. Yeah. But so for a DM of like a thousand, what's the total sort of time sweep over? So the survey actually can cover L band as well, so it's not just that. But like I say, at, with the X band observations, let's like say. Yeah. What is the total dispersal? I know for 500 dm, it's 70 uh, milliseconds. So for 1,000, it's like double, like a few hundred milliseconds. Uh -huh. Okay. So you have like a, you have several. Yeah, you do have it. Okay. It's okay. A, so 500 millisecond is not that constraining. I think you have that. Um, but the problem becomes that at high frequencies, some of these bursts become extremely narrow. That's what we have seen for FRB. Oh, I see. We're doing a Yeah, the sensitivity loss is. Well, I speak in the AK, I just know this is like one of the things that takes the case to be yeah, yeah. So it'd be interesting to sort of flesh out like exactly where the ACON do with this survey would fall. Mm -hmm. And then sort of, you know, what 
Okay. Okay, we better move on, but uh, thanks, Karen. Um, so I think our next scheduled speaker, Giovanni, was having some connection issues, so maybe we'll come back to him. Conveniently, that puts us almost back on time. So um, next up is Anna Ganben, um, who'll be going to uh, UC Santa Cruz, I think probably starting in a week or two, so take a look. <laughs> It's closer to about a month now. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, my name is Anna Ganneman. I've been working with Dave DeBoer this summer, um, and I've been working on kind of making a we're working, the goal is to make a database of satellites um, to study interference on specifically ATA observations, that's our test case, but just um, radio and all kinds of observations in general. So the background of the project, the incentive really is that because there are so many more satellites being launched just um, every single day, it's really started to have an impact on astronomy. Um, it's there's RFI in radio astronomy. There's also leaving tracks in optical astronomy. Um, and so when I started this work on June 15th, there were 7,848 satellites. And as of this morning, um, you know, about an hour ago, there were 8,369. And that's just active satellites. So um, that's over 520 launched, but it could be that there were more launched and some of them are not active anymore. Um, and so you can see kind of on this graph right here, you see the number of satellites is really dominated by the low Earth orbit. Those are those commercial ones. Um, the y-axis is on a log scale. So this would really be much higher. You wouldn't even be able to see the higher Earth orbits, the HEOs, um, without it because it's so dominated by the low Earth orbits. And so really, I've been looking for studies on these impacts or kind of just how many satellites there are, things like that. And they haven't been done in well over 15 years, which you can see from this graph that I found from Statista. There were less than 1,000 telescopes uh, or sorry, satellites about 15 years ago, and now there are you know over 8,300. Um, so this is something that's really starting to impact this even more. And so I've been looking at the satellites that pass over specifically again the ATA. That's our test case. Um, so kind of how often, what kinds, and at what frequencies. So I've been using um, two-line elements, TLEs, from Celestrack. They have a really good database of active satellites. Um, and I've been kind of creating these maps of satellite density over Hat Creek. So on the this first one is the um, HEO, the higher Earth orbit satellites. Those are mostly like science cases, um, TESS is up there, uh, things like that, science, space missions. Um, and there are like two major orbits right here. Um, uh, actually, that's for sorry, that's the wrong one. But anyway, um, and then you have the geosynchronous and geostationary satellites. Here you have the geostationary arcs, so those kind of just remain static on the sky. You also have these big loops; those are the geosynchronous, not geostationary. Um, you have the MEO, the medium Earth orbit. Those are the ones with the two major orbits. Here you have the semi-synchronous arc, so it's kind of like the geosynchronous, but they pass twice every day instead of once. Um, and then again dominated by the low Earth orbit satellites. Um, and so kind of something that I wanted to mention about these plots is that um, the, first of all, these color bars are on a log scale. So that's how you're able to see kind of more things in, especially like this plot. Um, and then also the bottom half is empty on purpose. Um, I do have ones with like full sky, but this is just because we're only looking at ones that are passing above the ATA, there are many more below the horizon, but these are just ones above the horizon. And then you have for all active satellites, um, again, mostly dominated by the low Earth orbit. These are looking about with 0.9 degree resolution, and I'm looking at their positions in every 10 minute increments. Um, and also I'm using these two line elements to kind of separate out the four different types of satellite orbits, which I showed that graph before, and then just looking at some overall statistics, which I'll talk about in a second. So another thing that we're kind of taking into account is these big constellations. Um, the low Earth orbit satellites tend to travel in constellations because they're really close to the surface of the Earth sometimes. So they can only like um, communicate with a small portion of the surface. And so they have many in different constellations. 
Um, so you can access a greater amount of the surface at any one time than you can with one satellite. Um, so this is an example of one. This is uh, the Iridium constellation. This one's for like mobile communications, cell service, things like that. You have OneWeb, which is another major satellite um, internet service, and then Starlink, um, which you can see right here. Are this one is the North Pole, that's the South Pole. Um, so they kind of they're in polar orbits. So they kind of um, concentrate around the poles, and then you have kind of these ones traveling together. Another thing that we're looking at is the frequencies of these telescopes. So I'm using a, a satellite frequency database scraper that was developed by two different postbacks here. Um, and it's not quite complete. There's a lot of missing Starlink ones here, but all of them lie between 10.7 and 12.7 gigahertz, um, which might be slightly too high for the APA, depending on the way that you look at it. Um, and then we found, again, that using just this database, they're mostly between two and three gigahertz. So that's that plot right there. Um, but again, there's a lot missing. There's, um, I think at this point, less than half of the satellites are in here. And I am going to be continuing this work up until I leave for school um, next month. <coughs> so in the upcoming weeks, I'm going to kind of start satellite observations, which I know I've been saying for several weeks, but hopefully coming up soon. Um, and then also I've been looking at these statistics um, time. So another, this one last plot here um, is showing, basically this is looking at finer resolutions for time, seeing if there's any kind of windows where there are little to no satellites um, present so that we can um, kind of use for um, timing observations, scheduling observations, so you can see when there's less satellites. And then um, we're also working on the first draft of a paper about all of these things. That's it. Thanks, Anna. Questions? Jamie? Yeah, uh, this is an extraordinarily interesting topic. I find it interesting because with many people, when they think of Starlink and these constellations, they've heard about the interference that they cause in for the optical astronomers, mm -hmm. but very rarely the press you read about radio astronomy. And something, if you go back a few slides where you have the Starlink or more, this one? Yeah, so the the the, the bees mm -hmm. and those must be new deployments because they have yeah. yet to kind of um, uh, end up where they want to end up. Yeah. But an interesting thing to plot would also be because you know, everything from geo above usually stays in space forever mm -hmm. if they go into graveyard orbits. But everything in Leo and below and Neo and below end up having shelf life. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what does the the orbiting mm -hmm. rate looks like? Yeah. Versus the, and um, what we're putting into space. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you looked into that. Um, I haven't actually, but that would be something that would be interesting to look at. Yeah. Because um, the rate of, yeah. I have no clue what the rate of mm -hmm. work itself, yeah. but I'm pretty sure it's increasing. Yeah, I would, I would think so. Um, I was looking at some of them. I had mentioned a few weeks ago that there were like 150 satellites launched and a number of them were Starlink. Mm -hmm. But I think that that wasn't exactly true because some of them, it was probably more than 150 because some of them had um, become, uh, they weren't active anymore. But I think part of that, some of them are still up there. They're just not transmitting anymore. Some of them have like probably fallen out of orbit. I think it just depends. Yeah. And, and then a follow up thing I was thinking about mm -hmm. artificial things that end up in the beam. And you have aircraft and other yeah. types of flying objects. Are these causing more interference than aircraft to the types of observations that are done at the ATA? Um, that I'm not totally sure about, but I think that we're just trying to kind of get a handle on these things before it gets so much worse. I know there's like 400,000 or something planned um, satellite launches. So I think we're trying to see. I'm, I'm sure that if it's not already, it will become more of a problem at some point. But I think the thing with aircraft is they're better. We have a better handle on uh, kind of what they're doing mm -hmm. than we do for satellites. Because um, like with these frequencies, there's a lot of them missing because it's really hard to find like the frequency information for these. Um, so I think that aircraft are uh, better regulated than satellites are. And I think when we were in Australia, Andrew, we learned that they're broadcasting and there's a bunch of noise coming out of frequencies yeah. that weren't planned yeah. at all. Yeah, there's so a, a, yeah, a paper just came out, I think that was done at ILOFAR that was about the kind of um, noise that isn't supposed to be coming out of Starlink that was at very low frequencies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we have to move on. So um, thanks again, Anna. Next up is Joseph Pan from the University of Kansas.
Hello, everyone. Uh, Steve Stedd and Joseph Hand from the University of Kansas, rising junior. Uh, this summer, I've been working on identifying potential technical signatures in Apogee data using alias with Howard Isaacson and Jim Davenport, who is, I know Jim is online, I'm not sure if Howard is, he might be. But so this is a uh, near infrared optical SETI project. So instead of most studies done in the radio wavelengths, partly because you know radio communication has been around a while, and so we sort of understand it very well, but We've also recently started looking in at near infrared and optical for potential techno signatures. This is because there are certain technologies that are better suited for optical near infrared, such as propulsion using lasers. It's hard to difficult to do that with radio waves. It's much easier with near infrared optical. So there's been a sort of rising effort in the past few years to look for potential techno signatures in these parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so I've been working with data from Apogee, which stands for Apache Point Observatory Galactic Evolution Experiment, which is, uses a, a near-infrared fiber spectrograph with a wavelength range of about 1.5 1.7 micrometers. So that's pretty solidly in the near-infrared. Uh, it has it's pretty high resolution with an R value of about 20,000. This puts it at fairly high resolution, not the highest we have, but still plenty, plenty high enough for what we want to do. Um, so there have been many examples of this sort of research done in optical. You can see all the citations at the bottom and also the figure on the right here from Lippmann 2019. Uh, it shows the sort of signals we're looking for, which are these sharp emission features that would look like what would come from a laser. So uh, the reason we're using Apogee for this is because it's a very large data set. I mean, the SCSS who runs this experiment uh, has it's been running since 2009 and it's observed almost a million stars and all their spectra are publicly available, which makes it a huge amount of data to potentially look for these sorts of signatures. So if we take a closer look at these individual spectra, you can see on the top right here, this is what a single spectrum looks like. It's got this sort of overall shape, mostly due to the varying sensitivity of the instruments across the wavelength range, but also due to things like just the intrinsic emission of the targets we're looking at. Most of these are stars. So you can also see there are gaps. The spectrum is divided into three pieces. This is due to the instrument itself. They have an array of CTVs that they shine the light onto, and there are gaps between them. So they're just not sensitive to light at those frequencies. And you can also see these very sharp emission and absorption features. The absorption features are mostly due to the stars themselves, because of chemicals and elements in their atmosphere that absorb specific wavelengths. The emission features are mostly due to the Earth's atmosphere. Scars don't usually glow at any particular wavelengths at these, free, at these wavelengths. So most of this is due to uh, molecules in the Earth's atmosphere, uh, elements in the Earth's atmosphere that glow particularly strongly at these specific wavelengths. And this is, an, this is annoying for the type of research that we're doing because these very closely resemble the sort of signals we're trying to find. So the only way to really get rid of them is to look at a large number of stars and say, oh, there are all of these have an emission line here. So it's probably not a techno signature, it's just an atmospheric emission line. Uh, so to select the targets we're looking at, we just want to have a uh, collection of stars that are all very similar and have very high quality spectra. So we did a signal to noise ratio cut of 250, which means we're looking at very, very high quality spectra. And we're limiting ourselves to solar type stars. So at the lower left, you can see it in our diagram. The uh, red box shows the outline of the cuts we're making to select our sample. Uh, the blue dots show the ones with high signal to noise ratio. So in, in that box, the, the blue dots are about 12,000. That's our sample. Those are solar type stars that have high quality spectra. So what are we doing with spectra? How does ALIS work? So we start with the spectra, obviously, and we do several steps to sort of clean them up. These include normalizing and blaze correcting them. This is to remove that overall shape to make it so the spectra are more or less perfectly flat. This allows us to very easily find absorption features. You don't have to take into account that parts of the spectra are just higher than others on the flux plot. Uh, once we do that, we then subtract the median of all spectra. This allows us to remove common absorption features to make it even flatter and will accentuate emission features in only a couple stars that happen to fall into these lines. So if there's an emission feature inside an absorption feature, that absorption feature will be removed and that emission feature will become much more obvious. Once we do that, we then do a threshold crossing sort of uh, filter where we just basically draw a horizontal line above the continuum, about 10% of the star's entire flux. And we just say, where does that the spectrum cross that line? And we log all of these and then we characterize these crossing events by fitting a Gaussian to the spectrum at that point. This allows us to find things such as the width, the amplitude of the emission, and its exact, well, 
a much more accurate wavelength than just well, what pixel is it at? And this allows us to do simple classification by looking at these parameters to figure out which ones are likely technosignatures, which ones are probably cosmic rays or atmospheric emission lines. And then once we have a small list of promising candidates, we do a ranking step where we just we take a closer look at these properties and sign that this one's more likely to be a techno, techno signature. This is less likely to be a techno signature. I'm sorry I'm glossing over a lot of this, but for the sake of time, I couldn't go into any great detail here. I do have a bunch of backup slides if anyone has any specific questions about any of these steps work. But what do we get? Well, um, the currently the last step of that process that I got working well is the characterization. So fitting the Gaussian and finding the width and amplitude. So here you can see the error of the wavelength amplitude and width with doing injection recoveries. So we inject an artificial signature mimicking what they, we would expect them to look like. And then we try to use the algorithm to retrieve it and see how well it did. So we can see that the wavelength error, the mean absolute deviation is 2000 to an angstrom, which is very good. It means it can over half the time get better than that accuracy in the wavelength. Similar with the width, the width is, um, it gets within half the time, it gets within 200 to an angstrom about. Uh, the amplitude is not quite as good. It's 18% of continuum flux, which is not very good, but luckily that is, amplitude is one of the least important features we're looking at to determine whether it's a techno signature, because there are a lot of factors, such as just aliens using a brighter or dimmer laser, but that could affect that. So we wouldn't want to use that as a very strict uh, marker for whether something's a technical signature. So it's not a, that big a deal that it, you know, recovery of the amplitude isn't very accurate. Uh, additionally, we have the uh, mean squared error of the fit, which is fairly low for all of them, indicating that these do fit roughly Gaussian shapes for the most part, which is good. Uh, if we run through the entire process, do all the classification of ranking, these are the top six candidates it finds in the current collection of spectra. So there are a couple of these that are just seem to be maybe just some noise that happen to look like a signature, but some of these, particularly the uh, lower mid one in the middle, are look very good. It has a Gaussian shape. It's the right width that we would expect given the point spread function of the spectrograph. It has a wavelength in the range that we're looking for. Uh, there are no other stars that have emission features at this wavelength, so it's unique to this particular spectrum or this particular star. And yeah, this some of these candidates definitely prompt further investigation to see if they could be a technical signature, if there's some other astrophysical explanation. So with that, uh, I'd like to wrap things up. So in conclusion, near SETI, searching for extraterrestrial intelligence in near infrared and optical wavelengths is a promising area of SETI research that offers a uh, different sort of parameter space of technical signatures compared to radio. Uh, currently we're using a tool called Alias that does this search in a large Apogee data set. And current, in its current state, it can accurately characterize the events it finds, but it, there still needs to be some improvement made to the uh, classification and ranking systems to get the best candidates at the top and get them in front of people that can look at them and inspect them. Uh, other future work I would like to do after this internship would be to try and generalize this algorithm to non-solar type stars. This could be done, for example, by just dividing up the HR diagram into a bunch of boxes and processing each box separately, or maybe doing something like a model grid like Anna Zuckerman did earlier this year. And additionally, I would like to try to get this working on lower signal to noise ratio stars. So that, do we have any questions? Questions? Andrew. I have several questions. I'm sorry about your schedule. <laughs> um, so uh, for a typical star, you have like in this big, just like the entire public archive. Of no, we're just doing a uh, whole different stars having the 700,000 that they have. But you pulled it from like this. Yeah, I did. Archive. Yeah. So like typically, do you have like only one observation of each star or do you have like multiple observations? Um, it varies. Uh, the uh, SCSS sometimes will go back to the same star many times just because that just happens to be looking at that area. Some of them have, have as high as 16 different visits. Um, uh, most of them only have one or two. So, but I am taking the cat, that into account and processing each visit separately as a separate spectrum. And then in the, once it gets to the classification and ranking, I'm combining the spec, those visits from the same star to look at, is the signal consistent across all of them? Does it only appear in one? And I'm using that as part of my ranking. Okay. Is alias, this is code you wrote? Uh, yes. Oh, okay. This is what you named it. 
What is the format of the Apogee Spectra? Is it like a special format? Or uh, they're FITS files. So it's files. It's okay. just okay. pretty standard. Um, and then I have one more question, which is I just I'd be interested in your speculation on this. So in, with this approach, you have like a very explicit definition of the kind of signal that you're looking for. Generally, yes. And you develop this sort of matched filter to mm -hmm. look for that particular thing very sensitively. Um, did you guys think at all about like more generic, like kind of anomaly approaches or like yeah, AI we, ML kind of stuff? Is that like in the cards for the future? Uh, we didn't really consider ML exactly, but we did consider trying to make this algorithm more general. So it, it would be fairly easy after this is made to just simply go in and change some of the classification conditions to have it detect other types of signals. So the, the parts of the process before that were tried, we tried to make them as generic as possible. So it's just, you know, if it crosses this threshold, it gets put in the list, and then we can process that however we want later. Yeah. So the only limit we place on the types of signals we're looking for early on is the amplitude of the signal. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, online? Okay. Next, so, so let's move on again. You know, feel free to post your questions on Slack later. And uh, next up is Tammy Pokani from uh, UW Medicine. All right. Hello, my name is Tanvi. Um, I go to UW Madison, and I'm working on the anti quinston search for techno signatures using two LWA stations with my mentor, Dr. Varghese. Second. Okay, so some background on the long wavelength array. So the LWA operates between 10 and 88 megahertz, and the two stations I'm using for my um, project are LWA1, which is located near the VLA here. Um, in West Central New Mexico, and the other one is LWASV in the Sevilla National Wildlife Refuge. Um, each station has 256 dual polarization dipole antennas arranged in an elliptical configuration with a max baseline of 110 meters. And the LWA has two modes of operation, which is the all sky imaging mode and the beam forming mode. So, why are we conducting a low frequency search? Um, so, kind of like what Rory was talking about. So below 100 megahertz region is kind of relatively unexplored compared to the water hole region. Um, so this 1.4 to 1.7 gigahertz region is kind of popular in SETI research because um, the hydrogen and hydroxide molecules emit radio waves with frequencies between these two um, gigahertz frequencies here. And considering that our communication systems utilize frequencies below 100 megahertz, it's reasonable to infer that extraterrestrial communication systems would be something similar. And the other advantage is that the lower the frequency, we have a wider field of view. And then another thing that's different about my research is that we're using what's called the anti-coincidence search method. Um, so typically, uh, SETI research utilizes the on-off method, where you observe a primary target for a certain amount of time and then follow it up with um, observing a different part of the sky as a means for RFI mitigation. Um, so what we do with anti-coincidence is we um, have two telco stations like simultaneously observe, um, observing the same source. And with that, you eliminate local RFI that affects um, a single station and you save a lot of time by not having to smooth to secondary targets. Um, so I've kind of been working on two projects this summer, mainly the first one, which is what I'll be talking about for most of the presentation, um, which is a narrowband signal search and FRB data. So the CHIME radio telescope picture here um, whenever it detects an um, FRB, it sends alerts to telescopes like the LWA, and they observe in the direction of these FRB sources. So across the 96 different pointings we have on this plot here, and the two tuning frequencies, which are centered at um, 63 and 78 megahertz, um, I have around 16 hours of data to analyze. And these data files here, we have a two hertz frequency resolution and three second time resolution. And for the second project, which I'm mostly working on after this internship is over, is conducting a narrowband search towards nearby exoplanets. So around 15 hours of data are, um, are going to be collected from exoplanet targets and five hours of observing time from the Galactic Center. 
So I'm using the same search pipeline for both of these projects. So I'll kind of run through it really quickly. But for any given pointing, I start off with um, two HDFI files, one from each station. I run it through TurboSETI, put it through my um, search script that I wrote. And um, if there are events, then what I do is take the same HDF5 data, I run it, um, I convert it to a filter bank format, put it through very center correction software. And then I take the output of this and put it through TurboSETI and my script once again to um, result in like waterfall plots of any events that are found. So the reason why I don't very centrically correct the data from the start is because the um, distance between the two stations is too small to produce a significant change in frequency across stations. So if I did go and correct um, like a pilot correction, basically what that would do is shift the frequencies of at both stations up or down by the same amount, which isn't really um, essential for me to be doing from the start. So which is why I only do it in instances where there are matching signals at both stations. Um, so for the first project, I'll talk about the search parameters quickly, but we set a minimum SNR of six, max drift rate of 10 hertz per second. Um, frequency can um, vary up to 50 hertz across stations, and the drift rates um, must be within 20% of each other. Um, so out of the pointings I've analyzed, which we have a plot of up here, um, we didn't find any potential candidates, unfortunately, but we have 12 events along with some false positives. Um, this plot here shows the number of uh, events per pointing across both tuning frequencies, and I will show some examples of events I found. So here, this is the event with the highest absolute drift rate of negative 0.54. You can kind of see it here in this plot and the same in this plot up here. I don't know how clear of a signal this is, but I thought it was really interesting. And it's important to note that the frequency and drift rate is observed to be the same at both stations. And then here, I thought this was some pretty interesting periodic RFI, it looks like. Um, this is the event with the highest signal to noise ratio that I found. And once again, like the previous event, we see the same frequency and drift rate at both stations. And here's some more cool events that I found. So um, basically across the 96 pointings, um, we observed a little bit more than 6.3 million stars um, using the Gaia catalog. And in terms of sensitivity, I calculated um, EIRP SCFD for each pointing. And um, as expected, as we go closer towards the zenith, the sensitivity of the search increases. And EIRP values are kind of on the order of 10 to the 13 watts. And then for future goals, um, so I plan to wrap up the first project by finishing analyzing all the pointings. I want to update my GitHub, um, hopefully write a paper and um, finish that pretty soon. And I also want to present my research for this first project at the AAS meeting in January. And as for the second project where um, we conduct a search towards nearby exoplanets, I want to schedule observations sometime in August. And after we process the data, I'll use the same search pipeline from earlier to find narrow band signals and hopefully write up the results for that as well. And lastly, I just want to say thank you to my mentor for um, guiding me along this project and also to Dr. Croft for giving me the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Questions? Anders. <laughs> <laughs> can we go back to your, uh, this is a great talk. Can we go back to your, your two candidates, like your candidate and your... This one or? Yeah. Yeah. So you said this was probably, or no, the other one. This one? The, uh, yeah, this one. So you said this one was probably RFI. What leads you to believe it's RFI? Um, just the, the very small drift rate here. It's pretty close to zero. Um, and I just, most of the events I found are definitely RFI because uh -huh. I found like 0, 0.00 something. Um, this, I just believe to be so just because looking at the, you know, the, uh -huh. Spectral. <laughs> Interesting. But yeah. this other one, the one you just showed. This one? You like this one better because it has a higher drift rate. I just thought it was interesting to look into further. Uh -huh. Just because um because like the the one like determining factor that like sets it apart from the other ones is that it has somewhat close to like a one drift rate. So I just thought it would be interesting to look at further. But this is also something we do want to look at looking at the looks like to be some kind of broadband uh -huh. um, features here, so. Interesting. Yeah. Um, 
And then I have a question about your SDFP calculation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this. So what did? How did you calculate the SDFP? Um. So actually, I used um, I calculated the beam radius, uh -huh. and then I used some actually some scripts that people at over at the OWA use. I see. I so see. I don't really have like the specifics. Yeah. But yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Was that in the very center print, the candidate that you were showing? Um, no, I have yet to apply that um, because I I was actually supposed to do that this week, but then there was a power outage at the OWA. Um, so I couldn't log into the cluster, but this is definitely like one of the next steps. So if you see a two event at the same rate, same frequency in the top of center print, that's mm -hmm. unlikely to be there. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Very centric will basically cause them to shift at different frequency and have also different shift rates. Right, but what we observed actually was that when we did apply um, correction, we basically saw that the frequencies at both stations were shifted by the same amount, which is why we didn't um, apply that from the start. I guess they're closer together than yeah. the low far. Than the yeah, how, I mean, how far away are they? Low far is, I think, 200 kilometers. No, these, are, oh, these are 75 kilometers. Oh, okay. So we didn't observe any. Yeah. So, Michelle, uh, one thing we noticed is that um, uh, we try to uh, you know, get an estimate of the difference in the relative velocity between the stations towards a particular source. And it seems like the difference is not significant enough to make a distinct shift uh, in the data when you apply the beta centric correction. So that's why we you know, uh, decided to move on without correction at the beginning. Then if you find something interesting, then definitely do the correction. All right, uh, thanks very much. Let's move on. Next up is Kayla Painter from Harvard. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm Caleb, um, and this summer I've been working on anomaly detection and RFI mitigation in GPT data with Dr. Croft and Dr. Lintot. Um, so, like that. so just some background to start off. Um, over the past seven years, Berkey Wilson has been searching for technical signatures in Greenback data, looking at over thousands of stars and 100 nearby galaxies. Um, technical signature searches of this kind have to account for two things, which is that there's lots of human generated radio frequency interference, RFI, and also that there's large volumes of data involved. At the moment, the current search algorithms have two prim primary problems, which are that uh, there are too many false positives being returned, and also that we miss promising signals from time to time. So there's kind of this need for improved traditional algorithms that complement ML or Turbo City. So Currently, the data um, that I've been using in this project uh, is from GBT. It covers a frequency range of 1.1 gigahertz to 11.2 gigahertz uh, with a 2 point hertz resolution and an 18 second time resolution and 30 minute cadences of on and off target pointings. The current pipelines that are in place um, rely on two filters, primarily a spatial filter alternating between the on and off observations and a Doppler drift filter to make sure that the signal has a non zero Doppler drift. So here's an example pointing at Voyager 1, and you can see the signals in the ons, but not the offs, which is kind of the thing that we're looking for here. Uh, RFI would be present in all the observations. Um, and Turbo Study implements this uh, filter using a tree Doppler algorithm. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of false positives returned by Turbo Study, and also uh, ML sometimes catches things that Turbo Study does not, uh, as in Peter Ma's paper, where he does a deep learning search, deep learning search of all these uh, candidates. Um, so I've been building traditional algorithms to complement Turbo City. Um, and the motivation for traditional versus ML is that it's more interpretable than ML. Uh, it's kind of a back box in a way, uh, what it returns and what it doesn't return. Um, and also it's less dependent on training data, uh, which we don't have much to begin with anyways. So the new algorithms I'm presenting are uh, a ranking system for Turbo City candidates, a alternative pipeline based on cross-correlation between on and off observations, and a feature characterization process to identify strong candidates in lower dimensional space. And I'm going to give a high level overview of all these. So to start off, we have a Turbo City candidate ranking system, um, which is supposed to narrow down the amount of false positives that Turbo City returns and bring the higher quality candidates up to the top of the list. Um, so kind of a broad overview, we take a candidate signal returned by Turbo City. Um, 
And initially, we just do a boundary correlation check, just check the correlation between the on and off observations at the boundary. So here's an example signal for turn by turbo study. Uh, it's only catching signals in the on observations uh, just by chance, uh, even though there's clearly signal in the offs as well. So this kind of correlation check will take care of that and move that to the bottom of the list. Um, we also implement some filters to check for broadband behavior inside the observations, which can get turbo study a bit confused um, by frequency integrating the data and then looking for peaks in that frequency integration. Um, after that, we do some more filtering to remove any lucky streaks or blips, such as satellites emitting every 10 minutes or so. Uh, and then we check if the signal is in a dense RFI environment, because ideally, I mean, there's no reason why it should be in an RFI environment versus some other kind of environment. Um, and after all these checks, if a signal passes all of them, we put them in the highest rank, which around 1% of the candidates pass. Um, and this is mainly to reduce the amount of visual inspection that is needed for the turbo study candidates. Uh, building off of that, I've kind of implemented the uh, filtering process used into a full search pipeline, uh, dubbed Cappuccino, courtesy of Steve, um, <laughs> which is a processing pipeline using cross-correlation to identify novel outliers. Um, and the idea is this, this pipeline is kind of based solely on the idea that the signal should be continuous in time so that uh, there should be a low correlation between the on and off pointings. Um, so we start by kind of finding regions of interest in the data files. Um, we go through and see, you know, what, in my case, six kilohertz regions have signals in them. Um, and then we filter out, especially dense ones, to kind of lower the computational time. Uh, and then go through a series of filters um, to check each of those little regions. Um, so we check the correlation number of signals, uh, such as here, which would have a high correlation. So, you know, we throw it out. Uh, we do some more filters to remove blips. And we also check the drift rate to make sure that the candidates are returning have non-zero drift rates. Um, and it's promising so far. It's recovering signals that are found by Peter Moss ML, but missed by Turbo Study. Um, you can see some of them here. Um, you know, these are quality signals. This one even has, you know, this line goes through all the off observations, and you can't see it on the projector, I think, maybe on your computer. There's a fainter signal here that uh, it's only in the ons that this is picking up. So it's kind of reassuring that it can pick up signals even if there is RFI in the same window that goes through all the observations. Um, we're also picking up new targets, such as this one to the right. Um, which is not super promising, I think, because of this weird drift rate that's not drifting very much, but it is a proof of concept that this pipeline will pick up signals that kind of exhibit any kind of behavior in the frequency space. This one's kind of bending, um, so it doesn't have to be a linear signal. Um, it's kind of very general in that way, this pipeline. Um, so that's this cross-correlation search pipeline. Uh, I've also been working on feature extraction and visualization processes. It's time to pickles, sticking with the food theme. Um, which is not a very good culinary combination with cappuccino, but the, <laughs> the algorithms do complement each other pretty well. Um, for this this one, was all you. But, uh, <laughs> this was <laughs> uh, so it's trying to take a very general approach to finding candidates um, by extracting the signal in the on and off observations and taking kurtosis as kind of a measure of signal strength. Uh, we can then kind of reduce that to just uh, two dimensions, the strength of the signal in the off observations and the strength of the signal in the on observations. And we're looking for signals which are very strong in the ons, but weak in the offs. So obviously this is limited to uh, strong signals in RFI quiet environments, because if there is also RFI, you'd have a strong signal in the offs. So it is limited that way, but it's still pretty successful at picking up uh, good quality signals. So here's another pointing at a uh, star hip 13402, uh, where I do this uh, feature extraction for all the regions of interest. And you can see the high quality signals fall where you would expect them to in this upper left-hand quadrant. We have a very weak signal in the offs, but a very strong one in the ons. So that's the idea behind this uh, process. Um, so far, I've been running it on the 100,000 cadences from the archival GBT data. Um, have not gone through all those yet. That's a lot of data. Um, but about 10,000 of them are shown here on this plot, um, which is a lot of points. But you can do some more filtering to narrow it down. Uh, you can take out anything that's a non-zero that has a zero drift rate. So you just have drifting signals now, um, and then you can do more post filtering to remove broadband and blips. Um, so there's about 8 million frequency snippets shown in this plot. Um, and, you know, I've been narrowing it down to a few thousand to inspect visually. Um, and here are some of the interesting signals that are coming up. Um, so we have, you know, pretty good signals being returned that were not picked up by other methods. Um, some of them, you know, pass the drift filter even when they probably shouldn't. Um, and other ones are pretty interesting because, you know, you get this kind of thing, which is not really narrow band or drifting, but it's a signal that's only in the ons and not in the offs. And that's what this uh, process is built for, a very general search. Um, so the conclusions are that traditional algorithms can be just as effective as machine learning. Um, 
new pipelines take different approaches than current search methods. So there are different kinds of signals returned, and we are more confident that we're not missing things. Uh, and also it's not biased towards any specific signal type if we use these different methods. Future work would be to do some more signal injection and recovery testing um, to finish running cappuccino and pickles on the archival GBT data. Um, and we have several promising targets that could use follow-up observations, which is the main takeaway. Uh, so yeah, with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, I have a few. So okay. first, your first bullet, traditional algorithms can be just as effective as machine learning. Yes. That's a pretty bold statement. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you want to caveat that in any way? Sure. I mean, obviously, it's different kinds of algorithms in place. Um, the point I'm making here is that it seems that the current traditional algorithms we have, like Turbo Study, do miss signals that, you know, deep learning searches have found, like Peter Search. Mm -hmm. um, and the point I'm making is just, you know, you can write traditional algorithms that pick up the same kinds of signals and that will find promising ones. Um, obviously, it's like two different, completely different fields um, of algorithms. But I think both avenues are promising and have their own advantages and disadvantages. And it's good if you have two that complement each other. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then you said something about kurtosis and signal strength. Yeah. And I was just wondering, like, I mean, kurtosis isn't really like a measure of like intensity. No. So what do you like? What do you mean by signal strength? Yeah. So just having nothing, just having a background, for example, was kind of Gaussian. If you just take that data um, with nothing there, which has uh -huh. a very low kurtosis, so it's just a measure of if there's outliers in this data, um, okay. which is what you would expect if you have a signal in a background. So like strength in this case is like degree of deviation. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. So. And then a few slides before you said something about a blip filter. Yeah. What is what is remote blips? <laughs> um, that's just what I've been dubbing these little kind of points in the uh, like, in, like a, a single pixel yeah. in prime frequency space that yeah. has a lot of embedding. Yeah, exactly. And why couldn't that be? It could. Maybe it could, but I can get a lot of those and I can't look at all of them by eye. So <laughs> not to come about it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean so if there were like, you know. A thousand times as many blips in the on as there was in the off. Yeah. Like that would be yeah. And that would come up on uh, this, ideally, if there's a thousand of them more. Um, oh, I see. So there, there's like some part of the pipeline that doesn't remove the blips. This, it will remove blips, like if there's a thousand of them and they're kind of um, coming through continuously in time. Oh. Um, then they won't get removed. Blips filtering, what I've been doing is just taking if there's a single data pixel that's throwing off the entire thing, uh, then I'm throwing it out. Uh, okay. Okay. But you know, if there's all little scatter points all over the place, then that would pass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I think we better move on. I see some questions from Nathan in the chat that maybe you okay. could sure. uh, answer offline. Um, but we're going to move on to uh, Erica Rea from the University of the Roma La Sapienza. Hi, Hall. I'll share my screen. Okay, can you see that? Yep. Okay. So, hello everyone. Um, my name is Erika and I'm a master's student in astrophysics at Sapienza University of Rome. The main aim of my project is to search for and analyze signals uh, originating from the galactic center in order to detect on, um, both intentional and unintentional signals um, emitted by civil, um, extraterrestrial civilizations. And um, the galactic center is the most convenient target when searching for extraterrestrial um, signals. And I use data obtained from the GBT in, uh, using the X band, which corresponds to the frequency range from 8 to 12 gigahertz. And regarding the detection technique, the idea is to point the telescope at two different sources, referred to as on and off pointings. And um, this is is to back-to-back -back, uh, observations uh, for three times. So like on, off, on, off, on, off. And um, since the off-pointings are all 
also uh, within the Galactic Center, they can also be uh, treated as on-pointing. So um, we have 19 pairs and each pair of pointings can be run considering the first pointing as either on or off. So after detecting them, uh, the work process can be divided into three steps, Trubacity algorithm, find event pipeline and plot event pipeline. So to make a signal interesting, um, it must be present in the on pointing. And it's, uh, if it's uh, also present in the off pointing, it's for sure a local signal and so an RFI, radio frequency interference. And additionally, an interesting signal uh, must display a change in its in its, in its um, frequencies due to the Doppler effect. So um, signals with drift rate uh, equal to zero will not be considered. And Turbosetti is used to um, search for linearly chirped uh, signals and filters its. A hit is any signal that is above a certain uh, SNR threshold and uh, within a um, uh, specified uh, drift rate range. So the entire analysis is conducted by setting a maximum drift rate of 4 hertz per second and a SNR threshold of 10. And uh, through um, find event pipeline, we, it's possible to choose the type of filter to use. Uh, filter one reports its um, that follow this SNR not zero drift rate criteria without on off check. Filter two reports events with signals present in at least one on and absent in uh, all the off. Filter three reports candidates with signal in all the three on only. So um, then we, um, using plot event pipeline, waterfall plots can be generated and visualized. Um, they display uh, this, the intensity of signals um, as a function of both time and frequency and with the intensity indicated by the color. And table one, shows uh, the high numbers of plots uh, generated by, for each pair and filter, uh, but unfortunately they are all RFIs. However, um, what is concerning uh, is that the um, plots uh, resulting from filter two and three uh, have signals in both on and off states. So filters don't seem to work well and this is an issue that needs to be taken into consideration later. In figure three, we can see the only plot that is totally different from all the others. And later I used MATLAB to plot vectors and here you can see some statistical plot uh, regarding the distribution of frequencies, SNR, but also drift rates and how also um, how drift rates change across frequencies. And maybe I don't have much time, but I want to mention that in the last days, I, um, I performed an analysis through BLIPS, that is rate release and um, investigation for periodic um, spectral signals. And here you can see two kind of plots uh, for a single pair. Uh, but to sum up, um, we don't, we don't find um, an import, any important signals, but this outcome is um, understandable uh, due to the nature of our research. And um, where uh, we can say that um, RFIs, an abundance of RFIs uh, is accept accepted. And um, however, there were indication of issues related to um, the filters and, uh, maybe um, one option is to use um, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning to improve the pipeline efficiency and the search for accelerated intelligence. So thank you very much for your attention. I am at your disposal for any questions. Thanks, Erica. Questions?
Um, thank you for a great talk. Um, do you have any plans to continue the work or write it up? If I want to continue the work, sorry. If you can... and, and write write it up into a paper. Oh, I'd like to do that. <laughs> um, I can hear you very clearly, so if you are... Maybe so you can repeat my question. Yeah, do, do you have plans to continue the work and perhaps write a paper? Okay, uh, no, I know that uh, Karen is con currently uh, write a paper on this, so um, I really uh, want to contribute to that. Um, I at her disposal for everything, but yes, Karen is just doing that. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Right. Thank you. Uh, next up is Brian Rogers from Queen's University Belfast. Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Um, this summer, I've been at the University of Oxford under um, Professor Chris Lintat and Dr. Steve Croft. And my project this summer has been doing um, anomaly detection in the legacy survey of space and time solar system data. And the legacy survey of space and time is going to be conducted here at this telescope, the Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile. Um, and it's due to receive its first light next year with scientific operations beginning in 2025. And the scale of the, the legacy survey of space and time is outstanding. Um, um, for example, if you look here at the camera that they're going to use, it's the largest, largest camera ever built. Um, and quite naturally, with the largest, largest camera ever built, you're going to make the greatest film that's ever made. And for 10 years, LSST is going to scan the sky every night. Um, and with this, it's going to revolutionize solar system science by expanding the catalog of our known objects by many orders of magnitude. Um, and we're going to discover kind of new and interesting things that we haven't seen before, or as much of it, like the interstellar objects um, that um, Calder talked about previously. But really, from the millions of objects that, that LSST is going to detect, this project started with one, um, and an interesting one in that. Naturally, it was a flying car. You might recognize this, uh, this picture on the right-hand side, which is Elon Musk's roadster in flying in space. What might not be as familiar as the plot on the left. Um, and what this is, is a color color diagram of um, where the roadster would lie um, versus some asteroids. So you've got your C type asteroid and your S type asteroid. Um, and it lies obviously in, in a very less dense region of this particular part of the parameter space. And clearly, this is very interesting for techno signature searches, um, albeit that this is one techno signature that we produced ourselves. But clearly, with one example, it was very difficult to do an entire project. So um, the next part really was kind of trying to make more of them. And this was the idea of, of creating synthetic anomalies um, that would land the solar system came about. So using the Gaussian mixture model and kind of distorting the distributions that they returned when it was learned on a specific region of the parameter space, a region that kind of just, you had a, an orbit and kind of described in three parameters and the colors that we use for the Tesla plot. If we could model that, and distort that distribution, we could create these, these prototype of anomalies. So you see them kind of highlighted on this plot. So what we've done here is taken that five dimensional space and kind of folded it down to the two just for visualization purposes. And you can see we have these kind of cluster anomalies. So these are groups of anomalies that, can, that, that come together in the parameter space. You have these global anomalies that kind of lie in very less dense regions of the parameter space and local anomalies that kind of cluster around the edges of the normal areas. Um, and each of these then could be um, subjected to kind of some classical outlier detection algorithms. That was kind of the first part is like, if we could detect these things, what kind of methods would work well? So we looked at, for globals, like K-nearest neighbor worked pretty well. For locals, local outlier factors. And um, for clusters, things like I-Force work particularly well. But the real um, kind of conclusion from this part of the project was any supervised methods was, was going to outperform. So in this plot, what you can see is the accuracy and F1 scores um, from the supervised model that, that we trained. So it was just a simple actually boost classifier. Yeah, I put whether this point was an anomaly or it wasn't. And these lines here indicate were the best unsupervised methods um, ranked in terms of their F1 and accuracy scores. You can see here that as a function of the number of labels that we provide to the classifier, we only needed 60 positive anomaly examples 
um, to outperform the best, uh, the 95% of the best can and scores for, for detecting global anomalies and one of the, the fundamental prototypes that, that we kind of engineered. And for the F1 scores, it was even better where you only needed about 40 labels to outperform. Um, but clearly we have a problem here. Um, how do we actually get the labels in the first place? So this is really where the idea of a synergy of approaches come using unsupervised, unsupervised methods to pick out where these anomalies would lie in the parameter space. And in this plot, what you can see is kind of a combination of those two unsupervised methods. What you have on the right, on the left hand side is using that GMM that we trained before. You could output some um, outliers in the orbit color space. And on the bottom axis, using an autoencoder and its reconstruction loss, um, which you can ask me about after if you would like. Um, you, could, uh, you could get an idea of where some of the outliers would lie in a larger region of the parameter space, um, a much bigger feature space. And what you can see is then some things pop out and these can be labeled. And when they're labeled, then we can train supervised classifiers um, using just human examples. This becomes much more manageable. So from the millions of, of objects that we started with, we're down to thousands and then to tens um, of outliers that humans can then look up. But the idea is then if we find interesting objects and how do we find more of them? And this is where the power of the audio encoder that was on that X axis came in, comes in. Um, and with that, um, because the autoencoder learns a, a latent space, um, similar points tend to cluster in that space. Um, and what you can see in this plot is a Trojan that was in the other plot. One of its outlier, um, it was an outlier. And when we query the points around that using just a K nearest neighbors in the latent space, as you can see these two clusters emerge. And on the right hand side is more Trojans. And those Trojans, when you analyze their properties, explained why exactly that frozen was an outlier and it was because of its high inclination um, and this is quite interesting for a number of reasons firstly it means that that deep model actually becomes something that we can interpret we can figure out why this thing was output as an anomaly in the first place but secondly it becomes something that we can search we can search for more interesting things um, and this idea of similarity searching is going to be very important as we discover lots of objects but really how is this going to apply back to techno industry searches? The idea at the start of this project then was to make this as agnostic as possible to any anomaly detection methods. So the idea of using a model um, like the GMM can be replaced with any idea that someone has for searching for techno signatures. Um, and again, using similarity searching procedures, we can actually look for things that are around it in the parameter space, which are quite interesting. Because I've got two weeks left, um, there's kind of a nice thing that's happened. Um, and there's a new simulation um, that's come out from, from LSST. And in, in DPU03, I don't have to invent my own synthetic anomalies, which is quite nice. In fact, I've put in a number of techno signatures. I'm told they're spaceships, but um, until I find them, I'm not quite sure what they look like. Um, and this is exciting, um, firstly, because it's a nice challenge towards the end of my project. But secondly, it's also encouraging that the wider sources community with are thinking about these problems. Um, and it's something that's going to be kind of in the zeitgeist as we move in the first light. And um, so again, that's going to be the next part of this project is what, what kind of features are going to maximize um, the returns on finding these technical signatures. And just before I go, I'd like to just thank um, Chris and Steve for their continued support throughout the summer. Um, I've had a lot of fun. Um, that's thanks to you guys. Also kind of want to thank um, Jim and, and Calder for, for the helpful discussions that we've had throughout the summer. Um, and also just a well done to, to all the interns today. Um, it's been great watching news every Friday, present your work, and it's really nice to see it all come together today. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions or you can just write me an email if you'd prefer. Um, but thanks for your attention. Thanks, Brian. Questions? Andrew. Um, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I have a couple questions. So the new LSST simulation that contains a techno signature, maybe I missed it. So the people that created the simulation, they inserted a techno signature into it? Yes, that's right. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah, I, I can talk very quickly about that. Uh, so it's because I'm at the Vera Rubin project meeting, but yeah, because of the workshop that Jim Davenport organized in Seattle, we got talking to them. So the it's their official simulation of the solar system and it has one or more techno signatures hidden in there um, for people to find. Uh, that's, that's cool. Um, and then my other question is, so I guess it's going to be like another, I don't know, year or so before LSST has first light, um, maybe 
a little longer than that. I won't say more than that, but um, I'm curious, are there any like of the LSST precursor surveys that might be um, sort of a potential data source for some of these techniques in advance of LSST coming fully online? Yeah, I would say perhaps Sloan would be a very good example. Um, some of the filters are actually the filters are going to be using and LSST are based on it. As ETF as well is a good kind of precursor survey. Um, I think Jim could speak to this this quite well, but those I think would be the, the two kind of um, main precursor surveys to, to this one. Cool, thank you. No problem. All right, uh, thanks very much, Brian. And next up is Connor Sheridan from University of Galway. Hello, can everyone see and hear me okay? It's a little uh, broken up, but hopefully good. Okay, sorry. Um, in the West of Ireland, the internet isn't great. Um, let me know if you can't hear anything and I'll repeat it. So, um, <clears throat> I'm Connor Sheridan and I'm an undergrad at University of Galway studying theoretical physics and um, this summer I was looking at lightning on Uranus using LOFAR and Voyager 2 and my supervisor was um, Professor Evan Keane. So lightning or uranium electrostatic discharges as they're formally called were first detected by Voyager 2 in 1986 when it flew by Uranus in January. Um, it was detected with the PRA which is the radio astronomy instrument aboard the Voyager 2. And that uh, splits its um, frequency range into two data bands, the low band, which is 1.2 kilohertz to 1.3 megahertz. And there's about 70 frequency channels in that. And the high band, which is 1.3 megahertz to 40 megahertz. And there is 128 frequency channels there. Um, DVDs themselves were detected in the range of 900 kilohertz to 40 uh, megahertz. But uh, 40 megahertz is obviously the upper limit of the Voyager 2, not the lightning. And the pulses on average lasted 120 milliseconds. And you can see from this plot here, they um, occur across from, so it starts on the 24th of January and ends on um, halfway through the 25th of January. And um, they occur um, in the 10 megahertz region across the whole um, two days, but um, only at closest approach do they appear over the full frequency range. Um, so anyways, we wanted to look at that data again and reanalyze it and see if we could get a tighter kind of parameter constraint on the, um, UEDs in anticipation of a first Earth detection, but um, we ran into um, an issue. The high band data was nowhere to be seen. So we first checked the PDS repository, which is the planetary data science repository uh, of NASA, and there was no sign of the high band there. So we looked at other NASA and non-NASA Voyager repositories that uh, contain much of the um, other Voyager data, but still no high band. Uh, we even inquired in some channels and got no results there. And as a note, there's also uh, missing Neptune data, I believe, as well. And that's like the only other um, kind of visit to Neptune that exists. So that was kind of a big setback because you can see this histogram here, like most of the um, pulses detected were in the high band, um, which is the um, greater than 1.3 megahertz. Um, so immediately you were kind of at a disadvantage there. And also it's the only visit to Uranus like ever. So it's kind of bad that we're missing such a big chunk of the radio data. But anyways, we um, carried on with just looking at the low far, uh, the, sorry, the low band data. And you can see here, this is a 30 minute plot, one hour after closest approach. And our search pipeline picked up um, a couple of pulses. Uh, these ones are already detected, I believe, by the original paper. Um, you can see there, they're highlighted in the red boxes. Those um, black bars there are just gaps in the data from however um, it was measured. Um, the horizontal thing is like Voyager 2 communicating or something. And then on the right here, there's just the um, intensity versus time of those two pulses. And you can see they kind of stick out quite a bit there. Um, that's just the one channel that they're most prominent in. I think it's like a one kilohertz bandwidth. Um, um, so yeah, like we, we could detect them pretty easily and we kind of had a bit of a constraint on what to look for. So um, we wanted to try inner detection using a uh, LOFAR, which is the low frequency array. And obviously, generally, like lightning, terrestrial lightning is like ORFI. So most people, you know, you want to get rid of that from your data. So trying to actually find it makes it a bit more difficult. So we decided to do um, a multi-site or um, what is it? The, the coincidence um, approach that was mentioned earlier um, using multiple uh, LOFAR stations. And there's a couple of um, hour long observations, but the one I focused on was um, one taken on the 21st of December back in 2021. And that used three LOFAR stations. So one in Ireland, 
one in Sweden and one in France. And you can see the three um, circle there. So they observed Uranus simultaneously for an hour. Um, and then I kind of got um, between searching for the high band and just kind of learning how to uh, examine these uh, large filter bank files. It kind of took me a while to get around to it. So I'm still in the process of searching a lot of them. But I decided to do a preliminary search of the 30 to 50 megahertz frequency range because ionosphere cutoff is around 30 megahertz. So looking for very weak pulses there is not really worth um, time if you're under pressure. Um, haven't found anything so far, sadly, that has existed in all three stations. So this is um, Sweden on the left, France in the middle, and Ireland on the right. The same um, time and uh, frequency axes, and you can see um, there's a lot of interference in the Irish one that doesn't appear in the other two. The brightness off to the right there is um, just the response um, curve of the antenna. It's not any measurement or anything. Um, so yeah, search is still ongoing, but uh, nothing so far. Um, but what is next is obviously a more advanced search of uh, the low far data is required. So yeah, due to time restraints, I only looked at the 30 to 50 megahertz range. Um, it occurs in other frequency ranges, definitely could be much higher. 40 megahertz is our upper limit only because of Voyager's capabilities and not anything else. Um, so a better analysis of that would be great. Um, more data in general is required, like Saturn lightning was actually detected from Earth using the UTR2 telescope in Ukraine. And um, partially the reason for that was just a stronger parameter constraint because they had flybys of Voyager 1 and 2, and then the Cassini probe was over Saturn, and there's only been one visit to Uranus, and as a previously mentioned that isn't very um easy to get a hold of it seems and then more frequent observations are needed like if you stick a camera out the window for an hour you're not going to get a picture of lightning generally so a single observation for one hour is unlikely to detect anything and they need to be a bit more reoccurring um so i hope to do some more searches and finish off what i'm running right now in the future and maybe find something but we'll see um thanks for listening and i'll take any questions now Connor, questions? Um, so at one time, I was involved in some solar system lightning work to try to detect lightning on Mars. Info was involved in this as well, um, unsuccessfully, but we found some RFI in an interesting way. But one of the things that came up with that was the sort of utility of monitoring in case of Mars for dust storms. And then conducting the observations at the same time that the dust storms were happening, because the idea was that the uh, lightning on Mars is caused by this phenomenon called turbo electric charging, where the dust rubs against each other and creates like a charge differential. But I was wondering if like you could do something similar with um, with other solar system bodies, where you sort of watch them like an optical for some sort of you know storm of some kind or some sort of activity that would sort of lead you to believe there might be light and then you could sort of time the radio observations. Definitely, yeah. Um, that's what they did with Saturn. And um, definitely, I think Jupiter, they actually optically saw the flashes and they just tracked the storms. But um, there's two problems with Uranus. One, obviously, is there's no probe stationed over Uranus in orbit. So we don't actually know much at all about weather inside the planet. And two, to make things worse, um, there's kind of like, you know, like if you've ever seen pictures, it's just very like it's one solid color. I think it's that methane that's causing just um, it to be completely opaque. So it like optically you can't see into it. Um, mm -hmm. So there's just no data, but definitely like that has been done with other planets and could be done with Uranus. We just need different ways of, you know, getting the meteorology um, data that we need. It turns out there's someone in the room who knows a lot about Uranus. I'm just wondering <laughs> what you think about that. And is it like, is, would there be any indication like that you could, would there be any kind of ground-based observation that you could do of Uranus that would tell you that there was some, that could allow you to gauge the level of activity, like the level of weather or so on? Uh, I think it's hard. Um, I mean, the low frequencies with low far is, is your best chance because you probe deepest into the planet where you might actually get down to the water level, which is where you might expect signals. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I mean, it's uh, it'll be it's a hard activity. Yeah. Thank you for great talk.
Yep, thanks. Yeah. All right, uh, let's move on to our next speaker, Jared Sofer from Lafayette College, uh, one of the NREO interns who's been collaborating with us this summer. Hello, everybody. And you see the presentation? We can, your uh, volume is a little low though, if you could get a little close to your mic. Uh, yeah, I can also try speaking up because I think- That's, that's good. My, detecting my uh, my webcam microphone. Um, yeah, so again, my name is Jared Sofer. I am a rising junior at Lafayette College. And this summer I was at the NRIO here in Socorro, New Mexico. And I was working with Shanoa Tremblay and Paul Demaris and also Lucy over there at uh, Berkeley. My project has been uh, to develop a new RFI flagging method using excess kurtosis in the Cosmic SETI. So Cosmic is the digital backend on the VLA that was designed to search for techno signatures. And one of the things that Cosmic does is it gives us a list of hits or signals that it believes might be techno signatures. Of course, we get a lot of false positives in that data because of RFI. So Lucy and I set out to create the artistic pipeline. Artistic stands for anomaly, RFI, and techno signature identification search and tabularization in Cosmic. And what this pipeline does is it removes RFI and other false positives from cosmic data. After the primary post-processing has been done by the rest of the cosmic system and the VLA calibration analysis data is uh, complete, then we pass the data to crickets or the categorization of RFI in cosmic with kurtosis for extraterrestrial searches. So this is the piece of code that I've been mainly focusing my time on this summer. And the main idea of crickets is that this is our first line of defense against RFI. So we take the data and we scan the we scan the frequencies and we try to figure out which of those frequency ranges are particularly dominant uh, dominated by RFI, and then we pass a list of those frequencies to the rest of the artistic pipeline. The rest of the pipeline is Lucy's project, so I will not be talking about that, but I direct you to her talk, which is two after mine, to hear more details about that. As for the data that we used to develop this new RFI flagging method, we used VLAS or VLA Sky Survey test observations that were specifically designed to identify RFI in the S-band. We observed 3C286, which is a calibration source known to have no fine frequency emissions. And it's very important that we use a calibration source because we don't want to accidentally flag out any uh, signals that are potentially interesting from a SETI perspective. Moving into more of the specifics of what Crickets does, uh, it uses excess kurtosis to flag the frequency bins that are heavily affected by RFI. So excess kurtosis is this, uh, the statistical measure that describes the frequency of outliers in a data set, where a Gaussian has an excess kurtosis of zero. And you can see the formal mathematical definition here being the fourth moment divided by the square of the variance, all of that minus three. We expect our the astronomical noise in our data to be roughly Gaussian. So outside of a or large enough uh, deviations from Gaussianity imply the presence of RFI, again, because we're using a calibration source. So you really have to choose the appropriate target to look at when you're passing the data through crickets. The inputs to crickets come in the form of filter bank files. So power, frequency, and time information are held in those. And each of those files, uh, in our case, spans 32 megahertz. Crickets reads in the filter bank files, averages the power over the time axis, and then uh, splits the data into a specifiable number of frequency bins. It then rescales the data and takes the excess kurtosis of each of the frequency bins, and it uses a specifiable excess kurtosis threshold to flag the dirty bins. So any frequency bins having an excess kurtosis outside of that threshold are flagged as dirty or having heavy RFI. After that, we output those affected frequencies to a table. Uh, so those frequencies and their corresponding excess, excess kurtosis, and we pass that table to the rest of the artistic pipeline. From there, the user has the option to plot two types of plots, which I will touch on in a moment. This method of RFI flagging is new, although it's not entirely unique. Other RFI flagging methods use kurtosis. Um, most notably, HyperSETI uses the spectral kurtosis estimator, which is a more complicated mathematical object. Um, but the analysis, that type of analysis, has the same effect as this. Cosmic runs SETI core, not HyperSETI, and SETI core doesn't have a robust RFI flagging method. So we wanted to develop a lightweight and efficient program that could help us flag RFI in that data. So I mentioned two user specifiable parameters, those being the excess kurtosis threshold and the number of frequency bins that you split your data into. And by playing around and fine tuning those parameters, you can flag very specific areas of RFI in your data. And to demonstrate that, I have a time average power spectrum here on the right. So we have time average power versus frequency. And these red rectangles that span the height of the graph, those represent the frequency channels that Crick is flagged as having heavy RFI. And you can see 
those line up with the power spikes here, which are signatures of RFI. And so crickets did a good job of analyzing this file. I applied this, uh, I ran 48 filter bank files through crickets and all of those files again span 32 megahertz. And these were all within the S band. The actual VLAS observations are in the 2.5 to 3.5 gigahertz range. And all of the frequencies, all of the data outside of that range is kind of extra, just so we could better understand the RFI environment of the VLA. So we ran all of these files through, like I said, and we flagged just under 30% of the frequencies covered as having heavy RFI. And you can see the results uh, summarized in this table. So the red boxes represent each of the different filter bank files where the frequency in the x-axis and the percentage of those frequencies uh, per file flagged. And then the gray boxes that span the height of the graph, these represent the filter bank files for which we didn't have data for in the S-band. There were some notable ranges in this data, all summarized in a table here. And to quickly go through them, we have uh, this file over here. This was our least affected file with less than 2% of the frequencies covered, having been flagged. And on the opposite spectrum, we have these four adjacent filter bank files, which were almost entirely dominated by RFI. You can see some regions where crickets didn't flag RFI in these, noted, uh, seen by these white spaces. And that's a result of the sinusoidal ripper, ripples at the bottom of each of the time average power spectrum. Those ripples arise because of the shape of the band pass of the, co uh, the, band, the cosmic band pass that uh, shows up when you're running the LA observational data through it. And so we've seen how that shape can create false negatives, but it can also create false positives. So the first point of improvement to crickets is going to be baselining. So removing that sinusoidal structure from the data. And we also want to restructure the code to move to an object oriented approach to remove some of the redundant code, make it more flexible, overall more efficient, and also allow it to more smoothly interface with the rest of the artistic pipeline. To summarize everything, Crickets is a package that flags RFI in the artistic pipeline, which is a small piece in the puzzle of the cosmic post-processing workflow, and it works by analyzing the excess kurtosis of frequency bins in the data that you give it. With a sample of 48 filter bank files, each of which spans 32 megahertz in the S-band, we flag just under 30% of the covered frequencies as having RFI. And if you want to read more into the details of how Crickets works, I left a QR code and a link to the GitHub page up in the top left. And with that, I'm open to any questions. And how are you distinguishing between like flying RFI or just flying like a high signal of signal of interest if you're using kurtosis? So, Sorry, could you repeat that? I only caught bits and pieces. So how are you distinguishing between like flying RFI versus flying like a high signal like signal of interest if you're using kurtosis as the only measure? Yeah, so um, like I mentioned, you really want to be observing the calibration source so you don't actually uh, you don't accidentally flag out any interesting signals. This method, you can't distinguish between RFI and signals of interest. Um, so the, the best approach would be to kind of set a conservative threshold on some sort of calibrator source that's relatively close to a source of uh, interest from a SETI perspective, and then create the mask using that calibrator source, and then go ahead and observe your SETI source. How did you settle on the 126 kilohertz bins for your um... Kurtosis. Uh, I was wondering, like, how you found that to be the most optimal in size. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was kind of by a fluke. I, I basically just chose a set of parameters, um, just randomly, just to you know start uh, the analysis with. And as I kept running uh, the files, I, I kept getting to a point, or I kept noticing that you know we weren't flagging too much, we weren't flagging too little in some of the uh, in all of the filter bank files. And if I adjusted the threshold at all. I would have flagged either too much or too little in some. And there, this was kind of the middle ground that I just happened to find on the first shot. So um, no specific reason for, for those numbers other than I happened to find them. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jared. Uh, let's move on. Next up is Sid Soliapan from University of Michigan. All right, um, well, welcome everyone. My name is Sid. I'm a second year data science student at Michigan, working with Karen and Michelle this uh, summer to look for time signatures uh, and got to playing pointings from the parks multi-beam receiver. 
All right, so a bit of context about the Parkes telescopes located in Australia, constructed in 61, 64 meters in diameter, but um, there are multiple receivers that are swapped out usually on the Parkes telescope. We're using the 20 centimeter multi beam receiver, which is now out of commission, but um, we're looking at frequency range between 1150 to 1550 megahertz. What the multi beam receiver allows you to do is look at different parts of the sky at the same time, so you can sort of uh, look at what signals you're catching in each beam and if they form a unique beam configuration that um, isn't present in all the beams, then you know it's uh, a signal of interest in the RFI. So this particular survey was, uh, we had, I, the data I looked at had around 13,000 pointings measured across 2,700 square degrees containing billions of stars in the galactic plane, 1,060 hours of observing time and a frequency range from 1150 to 1550 megahertz that my data uses. All right, so what we're looking when we're looking at the data collected through the pointings, we initially run it through Turbo City, which produces uh, 120 million hits initially. And there's sort of uh, two filters that uh, uh, are in the process right after that. Filter one has three parts to it. The first looks for a drift rate of over 0.1, checks to see if multiple hits you found are actually in a certain bound of each other. If not, you can eliminate certain hits, uh, in this case, hit number three. And the last part of filter one actually looks to see if there's a good beam configuration between the beams and you're not just um, catching hits from beams that uh, you're likely will be RFI. by. The filters that come after this are also right before the deep learning search. So filter two was kind of similar to filter 1B in, in the sense that you're looking for a frequency range that overlaps. In this case, instead of looking at the bounds, you look at the hit itself to see if they match. And lastly, um, we're looking at to see if they, the multiple hits detected were uh, within point one of drifting with, uh, within this uh, margin of error. Uh, at this point, we've generated about a, a million candidates and this is where the, C, the CNN search comes in. So quick introduction to CNNs. Uh, Essentially, what happens is there's a, uh, we have multiple filters running on a certain image, each containing a kernel, kernel corresponding to how many channels your image has. Every time you run the convolution, you're pulling um, your weights together to essentially create the feature map at the end, which is uh, a more uh, high level representation of your initial image. Uh, the example below is from the MNIST dataset, which is a popular ML dataset for handwritten digits. Notice as you move through the convolution process, the size of your feature map decreases. At the very end, you use a densely connected network, which is when people refer, reference a neural network, that's usually what they mean. And at this point, you reduce a number of features to the really uh, uh, the ones that uh, will make the most difference in looking at your image to see if you can um, make out any interesting feature signals. And so the good part about CNNs is that there's automated feature extraction, which means I don't have to specify, I look for the specific uh, drift rate. I incorporate them to train data. And another interesting uh, benefit was using CNNs is using transfer learning. Essentially, I'm taking an existing model that's been tried and tested by researchers in the field and retraining these to mimic, uh, to use the data that I've generated. So given that we defined the model, um, defined training data next, the background class is real data, real observations, 1954 channels and 19 to 20 time samples. And for the single class, we're taking the, we're using the same frame parameters, but injecting signals into these with SNR 10 to 40, drift rate from negative four to four, um, and centering the star frequency of the signal such that it's not uh, at the edge. And for the model itself, we're training it for 100 cycles, defining a loss function and sort of an optimizer. I did want to point out that we had around 24 million trainable parameters for this CNN. For context, that might not mean anything, but ChatGPT was trained on 175 billion parameters, so uh, not quite uh, trying to deal with it. All right, so looking at the evaluation of the ML itself, um, we tested around 10,000 um, uh, artificial samples. And what it misclassified were background images where the uh, image itself has features of a signal in them because this was randomly looked at in the filtering files. And the misclassification of the signals were uh, instances where it, it's really hard to see uh, if there's any signal in fact, and it's really low SNR uh, images. So as long as we're not missing out on the obvious ones, uh, I think we're doing fine there. But on the bottom left, that's indicating a receiver operator characteristic or ROC curve. 
essentially plotting the false true positive against the false positive rate. And that's basically saying I can reach a true positive rate of about 0 0.9, like 98% without getting false positives in there. And so at the end, well, we're running the CNN on the real data that uh, was processed after the three filters. The first three filters produced for the first half of the band around 920,000 candidates. After running the ML looking for good beam configurations through the beams, we, we found a total of 7,600 candidates at the uh, for that first half of the uh, band, which is a reduction of about 99% of uh, existing candidates. And for the other uh, upper half of the, beam, um, the band, we found that there was 140,000 candidates after the filter three. And after running ML on those candidates, we've generated about 4,000. So it's a reduction by 97%. And uh, long story short, TurboSA generated 120 million. We narrowed it down to 11,000. And to put this like in context, the survey in context with other um, large surveys in the field, this plot is showing you the sensitivity versus how much uh, area sky you've observed. Uh, looking at the x-axis, moving further right, the survey is decreasing in sensitivity. Moving up the y-axis, you're decreasing in the number of stars observed or a, a, the sky observed. And everything that comes above the gray line there is parameter space already explored, implying should ET exist, it's going to be somewhere down in the green region there. What we've done is uh, with the this survey, the galactic plane, moved down, uh, added a new point to that survey, uh, to, to this parameter space where the line is now shifted down, meaning we've eliminated a large portion of that parameter space. So if we don't find anything, future service can look at uh, the radius area. I do want to point out this was interesting uh, for me personally, because seeing a survey with names like Sagan and Tartar and Simeon too, I guess. <laughs> and uh, so looking through, look at the candidates that we have. This is not a candidate. This is a, a typical example of what RFI will look like in 13 beams. So you're looking at a signal of interest somewhere, but you also see the same hit in A2, beam A2 and 9, also 10, 11, and 12. So you're kind of looking for a signal that um, is particular in beams that are adjacent to each other. And this is uh, one that we uh, really liked because it is drifting at 0.13 hertz. It's the annotations are green in the beam, uh, beam numbers because Turbo City and the ML both agreed on there being a signal in this uh, particular uh, candidate. I also looked at another other examples where there are signals of interest in certain beams that Turbo City did not, either did not pick up or was rejected earlier on for not meeting the drift rate criterion. And so here we see it in beams one and three, uh, but not five and six. That was what Turbo City flagged. So this picked up on something Turbo City missed, but the ML flagged. Uh, another candidate here where we see it in beam eight uh, the that ML picked up and Turbo City did not. Uh, Turbo City is the, is the beams highlighted in red. Uh, there's a couple more of these, but in the interest of time, I'll just uh, leave it at that and say, we are seeing promising results and the next steps would be to uh, look at where we typically see RFI in, in this frequency range and narrow down so, and on what exactly could be interesting signals. Also, uh, I do want to like reduce the SNR threshold a bit to see if we pick up any interesting candidates that ML picks up, but Turbo City and the filters one, two, and three here rejected earlier on that could actually be signals of, signals of interest. So thank you. Hope questions. What is the precise definition of a good beam configuration? Is it just so it's usually so just I just usually say it's like beams that are adjacent to each other, but there are a, a list of 60 beam good beam configurations that are predefined. So we just rely on that. To where do the 60 predefined beam configurations come from? Is it is it your pulsar? I forgot the FRB 74 part one maybe they had already published uh, they would be configurations because uh, part uh, earlier they they done on FRB and basically, we can make sense of why these beams are chosen. They are like in close proximity. I mean, you can also derive yourself in the same way. Yeah, well, I guess that's what I was wondering. It's like there's a like a well for parks. I mean, there's and for air the same way. It's not there anymore, but there's a well established like analytical expression for the expected signal to noise ratio in all of the beams as a function of where exactly the signal is. 
So, I mean, the signal could be like right at or side of one of the beams, or it could be like right smack in the middle of like three different beams. And so, I guess I'm like these 60 beam configurations, these are like empirically determined, like using. Well, yes. So, based on the sensitivity test that they conducted before they did the FR research, uh -huh. these are the configurations they validated. It. These are what they call valid configurations. Like they expected some. Like they, they, they pointed it at some bright pulsar. Right. right. Or something and then, and then measured what you saw on that. Okay. So in some cases, you see, you see that the good beam configuration includes three beams. Uh -huh. In some cases, you include yeah, four yeah. beams. No, I mean, it's like each yeah, so each one of the beams is different. And different yeah, so there is some. Calculation they did earlier in the FR research. I think so it was quite only the effective part from before China part of the most effective kind of thing. Yeah, interesting. Well, that's it's great that you include that because I mean the simplistic way that oftentimes we think about these multi beam things, it's like, well, we see it in one beam and not at all in the other beams, but in fact, like it's much more complicated than that. So that's great. All right, thanks. We better move on. Uh, next up is Lucy Steppes from UW Medicine. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, you should be able to see my screen now. Um, I'm Lucy Steffes. I'll be a senior at UW-Madison studying astrophysics and physics this fall. And here's just a really brief summary of uh, the project that I've been working on this summer with Chinoa, Mark, and Savin on building a pipeline called Artistic to Analyze Cosmic Data. So starting off, what is artistic? Art, as Jared mentioned just two presentations ago, uh, artistic is the anomaly RFI and techno signature identification search and tabularization in COSMIC, which is the pipeline that we designed this summer to remove RFI and false positives from COSMIC data. And you can see what COSMIC stands for right there. But currently artistic is removing over 99% of hits or potentially interesting things that SETI core has flagged um, as being likely RFI or false positives through looking at removing the frequency bins with high excess kurtosis, which was Jared's project, and then setting thresholds on the signal to noise ratio, the drift rate, the beam separation, and the coherent and incoherent power ratios. So step one, the data that I worked with this summer was a set of early observations uh, from COSMIC, which was part of the third epoch of VLAS, uh, taken back in March of 2023 so a few months ago, um, and uh, we collected over 5.7 million hits, or those potentially interesting sig uh, signals, at about 7,700 unique stars. But most of these are false positives or RFI. So step two, removing the frequency channels with high excess kurtosis. So Jared provided me with some of the preliminary data from crickets um, to remove all of the hits within those frequency bins. So uh, because all that was taken at a calibration source, um, it's unlikely that anything that was within those bins was a real signal, but even if there was a signal within one of those bins, because there was such a high amount of RFI, we'd be very unlikely to be able to see it. Then moving on to some of the things that were specifically for artistic was splitting up the hits by the number of beams that they were present in. So because COSMIC uses beam forming, where we are able to go and digitally look at five different stars within a field of view at the same time, then we know that a techno signature should be localized to a pretty small region. We're assuming that it's coming from an exoplanet or a small object that is pretty far away from us. So I first removed all of the hits that were present in all six of the beams. So the five coherent beams, which you can see on the right, and the incoherent beam, this one here. Um, then I removed all of the hits that were present in two to five beams 
where the beams were spread apart on the sky by more than three of the beam sizes from the VLA, this being 2.1 arc seconds, with the VLA being at S band in the B configuration. So if the coherent beams were separated by more than 6.3 arc seconds, and I'm still trying to figure out what to do with all of the hits that were present in just one of the beams. Then I took the remaining hits and compared the coherent and incoherent powers, which should have followed this equation here, um, with the square root of the number of antennas being about 4.4, because I assumed that usually about 20 of the VLA antennas were on and working and doing everything that they were supposed to. So I cut all of the hits that fell beneath this threshold, which you can see in this plot here. So if they weren't following that 4.4 ratio, then they were removed. The next thing that I did is I was able to take 829 of the unique sources that we looked at and see that they were observed twice. So because of the scanning nature of VLAS and the beam forming method that we use, a lot of these stars were able to be observed twice, which allowed me to see that uh, some of the sources more definitively had zero drift rate. And even though the drift rate was uh, provided in these files for each of the hits, because the resolution is relatively low, I didn't want to just accept that those drift rates were as face value, but go and try and do a more rigorous calculation to see it, if I could figure out um, more definitively that it was actually a zero drift rate. So here, these circles represent hits at a given frequency at time one and time two of a single source. Um, if this hit was at the exact same frequency at both times, I removed both of them because they were showing zero drift. And if uh, the hypothetical drift rate that I calculated was above 100, I also removed it or removed that combination from being valid because it was unlikely that they were the same signal. But for these ones here, where they were relatively close together, where it was feasible that it was a sig the same signal that had just drifted in frequency between the roughly 10 minutes in uh, the difference between the observations, then I kept those and sent them to a short list. Um, I also want to mention that I made sure that each of them had a power difference within 20%, as it should have been unlikely that the power was fluctuating by that much in such a short period of time. So you can see the uh, how the frequency versus the power changed between those two observations with the purple in the background being those that included the hits with zero drift and the black ones in the foreground being the ones that I kept. The ones that I kept, I then sent to a short list of potentially interesting hits, which included 600 and 289 hits, which all had a signal to noise ratio less than 100 and were present in two to five beams separated by less than 6.3 arc seconds and the potential for a non-zero drift rate. And you can see here in this pie chart that there were several other methods that I used to further narrow down this search that I wasn't able to talk about very much today. But what have I been doing this past week or so is uh, inspecting the stamps files or the waterfall plots. So there are a lot more waterfall plots that get saved in the stamps files uh, than the ones that are just on my short list. So I was able to look at 676 rather than 289, but this allows me to go through and further try and see how well Artistic is working and narrowing down the search to see if either I missed something or see what uh, what things are still getting through the cracks and are being placed on the short list. So there are four different types of waterfall plots that I found. Birdies, which are uh, where there is a pretty small amount of RFI uh, right near a single antenna. So only one antenna spikes, uh, ones that were empty or that had such a low signal to noise ratio that at least based on visual inspection, I couldn't find anything. RFI and candidate. So I am so far ignoring all birdies and empty plots. 
Um, but here you can see one candidate that I have that um, I've also then plotted the locations of each of those stars to aid in verifying the candidate. So in beams one, three, and four, you can see that they are the ones that have a very slight uh, signal happening, and they're all pretty close together, whereas beams two and five are much further separated, and you don't see that same signal. So some conclusions. I am so far removing a little over 99% of all hits as false positives, and there are several tentative candidates found, but there's still work that I'm doing uh, to continue examining the postage stamp files to find candidates, as well as analyze how effective this pipeline is, um, and then optimizing the, user, the code to make it a little bit more user friendly, and finally investigating birdies and locations of antennas to see why so many of those are slipping through the cracks. So you can take a look at the GitHub repository for this code at the QR code right there, and I'm open to any questions. Thanks, Lucy. Yeah. Um, I was on the plot with the different waterfall plots, like six of them. Um, five of them, yeah, the errors are there. What is the first one at the very top? That is the incoherent beam. So that one takes the average of all of the emission within the field of view. Um, so you want to make sure that you're seeing something in the incoherent beam. Uh, there are cases where it could be feasible to not see something in the incoherent beam. So if um, there was a very faint signal in just one of the coherent beams that could be reason for there to be nothing in the incoherent, but it's looking at the entire field of view rather than just the smaller uh, fields around the sources. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Lucy. Uh, let's move on to Felix Weber from Oberlin College. Uh, should I sit here? There? That's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so yeah, I'm a writing senior at Oakland College, double physics math major, and my project this summer has sort of been looking into the stochastic behavior of pulsar variability and sort of a case study between uh, some milling and non-milling pulsars. Um, now, my project has been motivated by this one single study question. How could we tell if pulsars were being modulated by aliens, you know, if they were just somehow doing this? Uh, the answer is they could be modulating the brightness or making them null. These are both things that no one really has any good physical explanations for. So it might be interesting to investigate, investigate that from a city perspective. The issue is how do we actually uh, come up with a way to differentiate normal variability or nulling from intelligent communication? Uh, one answer of this, one answer to this is sort of look at the what's known as information entropy and complexity of the time series that we see. Uh, as communication, which is intelligent, will sort of stand out from background sort of noise. Um, now, as it turns out, uh, sort of this type of analysis or way of thinking is good at comparing and contrasting different stochastic models. Um, and this sort of may help us understand some things about how pulsars vary and how they may or may not null. Um, now, for, uh, for this project, we sort of did a little case study. Uh, we chose four pulsars depending on the brightness and availability during observation times, two of them essentially non-nulling, two of them uh, no nulling pulsars. Um, this was all done at the Allen Telescope Array up near Lassen. Um, we observed with the observation bandwidth of about 1.3 gigahertz in L-band. Uh, we took about 14,000 pulsars uh, in total, which is equivalent to about six weeks of the stock stock price data. So that sort of gives you a span of how much information we're looking at. Um, and we sort of did each observation for about a thousand pulses. This was sort of as a rough uh, limit to sort of getting uh, any long-term simulation effects affecting the baseline power that we're observing. And we sort of did this at a very high uh, uh, time resolution um, method. Um, oh, come on. Ah, what's going on? There we go. Apologies about that. Uh, the data that we took, uh, we sort of processed this through two uh, suites of softwares. One of them, Pipe. Um, this was sort of to take care of R5, D dispersions, and temperature corrections, and folding. And the second part, null analysis, was sort of automate the entire process of measuring pulse intensities over time. Um, 
Now, pipe stands for pipeline for interesting pulsars. Maybe ET, you never know. This was sort of a wrapper for several SIG proc and Presto softwares. And I think as many of you who have worked with pulsars before know that this is a whole zoo of different things that can be quite messy to work with. Um, and this was just sort of a way as a to automate everything, just to make quality of life of analysis just better for anyone using this. Uh, the second part, null analysis, this was something I wrote myself. Um, or it looks at the output of pipe, which is this um, sort of power over time uh, series, folds it across for the known period of our pulsar, and tries to identify where are the pulses in our data, uh, and tries to extract it. Uh, we do that by sort of limiting uh, sort of this filter, finds the peak, it's a simple sci-fi algorithm, uh, and then we blank it out and try to interpolate the background behind it. Uh, the figure on the right is sort of an agnostic plot as you're running the program across different nodes. Um, and after it's done this for each node, it then looks at the overall um, observation. We have about 14 nodes. And for those that have little to no RFI after all this filtering, those are then put together and compiled to get a time series uh, through our observation. This is an example of sort of one of our uh, background filterings. Uh, as you can see, uh, this, is, this is a rather nice one. Uh, some of them aren't as nice. It sort of depends on how much RFI you have in the data, but you can sort of see how well uh, just simply interpolating behind each pulse uh, can work because we don't want to be picking up any variations in the background uh, power that we're seeing. We want to just get the pulses. Um, and sort of this is what it looks like across multiple nodes. Um, the bottom labels, those are the individual node labels at the ATA, but generally lower is lower frequency, higher is higher frequency, sort of moving from left to right. Um, and you can see that the baseline power across nodes does change, but you can still see uh, correlated behavior across all frequencies. It's sort of what we want. Uh, this is also to help um, get rid of any uh, scintillation effects um, because uh, in certain frequencies, you might be not picking up as much power as in others. So the greater the bandwidth, the less this will start to um, impact the time series that we're picking up. Um, now, how do we actually go, and go about uh, understanding the information content of time series? We do this with something sort of called an epsilon machine. It's a type of causal Markov automation um, where instead of just looking at what is the current intensity and sort of building a Markov chain off of that, uh, it tries to work um, data into causal states where different states of the system have similar futures, hence causal. Uh, this has been shown to be very useful in modeling chaotic systems. Uh, and there's this algorithm called CSSR, causal state splitting recursion algorithm um, that uh, thankfully someone had written up in some C++ uh, that we've implemented for this project. On the right here is sort of an example of a Epsilon machine for basic uh, even process. Um, and so you can see here that it's the transitions that are producing um, sort of the output of the machine and each state uh, is only purely defined by the um, future transitions. Um, how these machines allow you to calculate two very important metrics. One of them is statistical complexity. How complex is this machine? Uh, this is useful in that random processes uh, score low and very structured processes score very high. So it allows you to filter out or compare sort of the randomness um, of the actual model. Secondly, there's a, another metric called entropy rate, which is how much randomness is not captured by the model. It's sort of give these two parameters give you a fingerprint as you sample numerical data um, at different resolutions. Uh, this is an example of such a fingerprint uh, for a uh, random Poisonian process for numerical data. Um, and these fingerprints are directly related to the stochastic process and are invariant for geometrical translations or sort of changing, for example, the average or the sigma of different uh, models. Um, However, some work needs to be put into that sort of understand how much they kind of sometimes slightly vary, but that's for future work. Um, now, with our data, we need to compare it to some benchmarks. Uh, we had two important benchmarks. One was a simple Gaussian noise model, which is sort of the null hypothesis for non nulling pulsars or ones that are relatively stable. Um, and then a simple stochastic nulling model, 
where we basically chose an on or off state um, with certain probabilities transitioning. And depending on if it's on or off, you choose from different uh, Gaussian distributions. And you get, uh, for example, this is one realization of such a process uh, for four different observations. You can clearly see the two different um, sort of distributions, one around zero with the nulls and one around one uh, for sort of the on pulses. Um, this is also something that's typically seen in many pulses. pulsars. Don't sometimes have a very clear on or off. Sometimes they're sort of more overlapping, uh, but this sort of gives us a basic tool to compare with. Uh, now, here are some of these stochastic fingerprints to uh, regraph to sort of remove the spatial component that I was talking about with the resolutions. It's purely graphing the statistical complexity and entropy rates of the different models uh, that we've produced from the data. Uh, how do you read this? Uh, so essentially the top, sort of the vertical axis, that's sort of telling you how complex these models are getting. Uh, the horizontal axis, that's telling you how much randomness is inherent in these models. And what we're seeing is that generally the more most accurate models are those that we find up here in this corner. These are the most complex, um, but also the ones with the lowest uh, noise inherent uh, in the model. However, the shape of these uh, curves here tell us a lot about how this how these processes behave at different resolutions. And you can see that if we compare it, this null impulsor J0953 plus 0755, um, we're getting models in our data uh, that are more complex and less random than a simple Gaussian process. This is something that we'd expect for a null impulsor. Um, and that in models that have sort of medium complexity, we're seeing that the pulsar exhibits more randomness in part because there is a process there that's not being captured by the model at that complexity. Uh, interestingly enough, we see um, a bit more coherence between our two non-nulling pulsars uh, and our Gaussian model. Um, and But there is still some discrepancies. For example, the Gaussian models don't become as complex as our pulsar uh, data suggests they should be. Uh, and there is some more randomness that's not being picked up by a Gaussian model. Um, and this sort of raises the question, okay, what does it look like compared to other benchmark? Uh, and this is what it looks like compared to a nulling model. Uh, so first of all, for J0953, we see a lot better sort of coherence between the two different curves. Um, interestingly enough, the two non-nulling pulsars uh, are showing also very great coherence. What that means is another question. It could be that there are some types of modal changes that we've not really investigated before in terms of brightness. Um, but it does suggest that the actual processes that these uh, uh, these pulsars have exhibited are more complex than just a simple Gaussian model may have suggested before. Um, but even for our nulling pulsar, we see that there are uh, some overshooting. So to say, if our nulling model works more random than the pulsar data may suggest. However, we need to actually look into the data and see how many, how much uh, different realizations can vary, because these have all just been calculated off of one realization of each of these processes. Uh, but that's very computationally expensive. There we go. Uh, and I haven't had the time this week to really do that. So I've been writing all this up. Um, and but it still shows us some interesting uh, conclusions. First of all, that. Um, non only pulsars may not be as simple as we thought. Um, <laughs> and uh, essentially stochastically related to null pulsars. That being said, this is more of a case study. Um, we need to take more data, but still this analysis shows us that we can sort of compare and contrast cast models in ways that we couldn't have before. Um, and we need to do put more work into actually understanding where the probabilities of picking up different curves given different models. Um, written this up all into a draft paper. I finished late last night um, and I put all the important software on GitHub. I still have to make one of the repositories public, but that'll be all done by the end of today. Uh, any questions? Questions? Have you then finished working on, not like a Gaussian, but just like some process which is going to have some complexity? Mm -hmm. Have you done any benchmarking not on random processes like Gaussian, but ones that are known to have some complexity to them? And compare that to what it looks like. The, the, the main issue with benchmarking is that there's so many options to choose from. Yeah. Um, especially for, um, so one nuance I didn't cover here is um, 
it's important that you use the same number of data points to compare because how many data points it has effects the curve you generate because you're able to pick up more things with more data. Um, and for example, for J0953, we had five oscillations. That's about 5,000 uh, pulse intensities. Um, there's about 200 dots on the diagram that takes about an hour and a half to calculate with multiprocessing on FRB node two at uh, the ATA. Uh, so if you want to do more benchmarks, that's another hour and a half of computer time. Um, that's just, you just got to pick and choose your battles essentially. But yes, there's plenty of space to explore what kind of uh, benchmarks to be used. I may have missed this, but what, what exactly is your knowledge model? The knowledge model is, um, we just start, we use a simple Markov chain. Uh, we have two states on off, uh, they have different probabilities of transitioning. Uh, Michelle has done some work into showing that this can be used to sort of um, generate uh, some basic uh, knowing models. Uh, and then in each of those states, you can just choose from a different normal distribution. And you can change that. You can change the, the sigma on each of those distributions, their averages and whatnot, but that's the general model. All right, well, apologies, we're approaching the runtime of Oppenheimer here, but uh, we have um, three more talks left for about 30 minutes behind schedule here, but uh, next up is Nicole. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicole. I'm a rising senior at Columbia studying astrophysics. And this summer, my project was not a time signature search, but a dark matter search using GBT L band data. Um, so, we are specifically looking for the axion, which is a theoretical particle that would solve both the dark matter problem and the strong CP problem in particle physics. Um, there have been a bunch of experiments looking for this particle, as you can see on this parameter space plot, um, where our search falls around here right now. Um, and our search specifically is looking through thousands of um, medium resolution data files from Breakthrough Listen's uh, nearby star sample from the Green Bank Telescope. Um, and the search only assumes three things, that this particle will decay or annihilate into a photon, so it interacts very weakly with electromagnetism, um, that the particle follows um, some density distribution within the galactic halo. So for example, there's more dark matter towards the center of the galactic halo. Um, and three, that the data will be um, Doppler and intensity shifted based on the target's position. So what I mean by that is that for any data files that um, fall in the direction of the sun's velocity in the Milky Way, the data will be blue shifted, likewise for backwards. Um, and then any data points that are towards the galactic center will be shifted up in intensity and any away from the galactic center will be shifted down in intensity. Um, and this search is really exciting because it's generalizable, um, not just for the axion particle, but for other dark matter particles, which allows you to probe um, larger regions of this parameter space because we are not assuming any sort of model for this particle. Um, so the general concept of the search is to um, form these template signals. So for um, Doppler asymmetry, we have an anti-symmetric signal. For intensity, it's a Gaussian signal. And then we um, sort the spectra and we form asymmetry spectra by um, adding them all up and then taking some differences. And then we cross correlate the asymmetry spectra with the templates um, for both injected and regular data to basically see whether we're detecting this signature. And lastly, we compare injected to the uninjected data using p-value calculations to basically see whether we're recovering the injections and statistically understand whether we're detecting this distribution in our data. So this analysis has been carried out for a um, limited region of the L-band around 100 megahertz. Um, and the analysis scheme was laid out. So briefly, um, we inject signals every 50 megahertz or, um, in the whole L-band. And then we do some pre-processing to the data, which I'll explain a little bit later. We fit a weighted polynomial to normalize it um, that preserves the signal shape. And then we do all of the asymmetry template format um, forming and then the analysis. And over the summer, I have done a little bit of validation of some of these methods, like the weighted polynomial, as well as trying a different asymmetry technique to just see if other methods might work. And it seems like we're gonna stick to all of the old methods that were outlined in this paper. Um, 
So the work that I primarily focused on this summer was removing the polyphase filter bank, which is a function that filters telescope data into coarse channels of 2.9 megahertz bandwidth and imprints this periodic structure on the data. And it's very dependent on um, properties of the receiver. So it's not trivial to remove. Um, and we remove it using a comb, which is a repeating 16 point array over the entire spectrum. It looks something like this. Um, there was a previous comb from the last analysis, but right now the um, residuals from removing the um, polyphase filter bank with that comb are sometimes on the same order as the expected signal. So we wanted to do a um, bigger study of other methods to comb the data. Um, so I tried a bunch of different things and I won't go too into detail, but um, the things that I settled on doing were doing a preliminary flattening of the data and then optimizing a comb um, to minimize the median absolute deviation, which is a method that's more robust to outliers and doesn't create too wonky of a shape. So these are just some examples of combs that I constructed. And then with all of the combs I constructed to, I guess, validate how well they were performing, um, how well they were removing the band pass, I produced these final p-value plots. So what we're looking at is a certain signal size. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have uh, n times sigma. And then on the gray vertical lines, this is where we've injected a signal. And this is a pretty good result across the band because we can see that um, it's able to recover the signal versus the regular data. Like So these, it's able to recover that the signal was injected in the injected and it doesn't exist in the uninjected data. Um, and we're looking at above five sigma for um, something significant. So it looks like the new comb is performing well across the L band, at least for a large signal. And then um, a lot of what I was doing was comparing different combs um, and different signal sizes. Um, so when we compare it to the old comb, we see that first of all, the preliminary normalization is removing a lot of this noise because um, we're doing two different schemes. And second of all, um, there are, I guess, more lines that fall on the injection frequencies than with the old comb. So that's a promising result. And we're probably going to um, stick with one of these combs that has been constructed over the summer. Um, another thing that I worked on briefly over the summer was trying to figure out bandpass removal for techno signature searches, which use the high frequency resolution data. Um, so this process would, again, not be as easy because there are a lot more fine frequency channels in a course channel. Um, so what I tried doing just very briefly was dividing this data by a flat unit cell from that um, clean region of the spectrum um, and just see what the outputs would be on TurboSETI after making this correction. And I saw that um, around 10 or 8 to 15 SNR, there was uh, much more biased noise statistics. So we had a lot more hits by like a factor of 10. So I guess preliminary concluded that it would not be a good idea to remove it unless you're setting a much higher SNR threshold. Um, but I still wanna do some work on um, possibly using the medium resolution data products and then interpolating up to the dimensions of the um, high frequency resolution files. Um, but this also might bias some potential signals for the study search. So that's it. Um, I plan to continue working on like everything I've been doing. Um, we are going to run the entire analysis for the L band by the end of this month and see if we can set any new limits um, on in the other frequency ranges that the preliminary paper didn't search. Um, and then eventually we're going to move on to the SC and X band data. Um, and then uh, further into the future, it's promising to apply this method to more sensitive telescopes like Meerkat to probe deeper into the parameter space. And like I mentioned, I'm hoping to use the most recently optimized comb on the techno signature data and see if that does anything different. Um, all of the um, code that I wrote preliminarily and that I kind of updated for the comb process is on my GitHub and it's documented. Um, my GitHub is just my first and last name. Um, and then there's also a document explaining everything I did um, to try to remove the benefits. Thank you. All questions? Uh, what is the typical width of these lines that you are that one would expect? I think they are in kilo over. Yeah, I think they're uh, also, I also think they're on the order of a few kilohertz because we're not using the fine frequency resolution data. 
Okay. Yes. So the actual the, the analysis you did on the mid the twenty. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering how you chose what frequencies to inject. Signal that it looks like we're using the space. Yes, so we inject every 50 megahertz uh, across the spectrum. And then something that we vary that I didn't mention um, is where we inject it. So in case we're injecting at weird places, a lot of noise um, in the whole analysis, we inject at starting frequencies every five megahertz. So 10 different times to cover a bunch of different spaces. And it's going to be like at all different parts of the sort of home shape. Like that. So some signal will be injected at the in the exactly. The yeah, yeah. And one thing we do is we excise those value points um, for the dips because they prove to be really unstable when we're removing the band pass. All right. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, next up is Dana Yatanko, University of Florida. Hi, everyone. My project this summer has been searching for megastars within tests advised by Dr. Anne Marie Cody. I just want to give a special thank you to Daniel Giles, John Huang, Howard Isaacson, and Steve Croft for helping me along with this project and making it possible. So first off, what is a megastructure? For the purposes of our project, we're defining a megastructure as a type of techno signature. So you guys all know what a techno signature is. And it's a, a solid object that's landed larger than a planetary scale. And if it's non-spherical, that might be an even better indication that it's um, a megastructure rather than a naturally occurring body. So how do we detect megastructures? Well, we use the transit method. And for those of you who don't know what a transit is, basically it's a method of exoplanet detection that we're using for our purposes, where if a body passes in front of a star from our perspective, it creates a dip in the signal. So we're using data from TESS. It's um, a unique opportunity to do SETI with TESS um, in the optical because it images millions of stars and um, gets like pretty good data over month-long timescales at least. So the things that affect what a transit looks like are the depth of the transit is affected by the object's um, size compared to the star, its velocity across the plane of the planet, which affects the width of the transit, and it's the object shape itself. So here I generated a couple um, transits for different shapes using APA Transit Python package by Emily Sanford. And here you can see that the shapes of uh, the transit shapes of different objects are like slightly different. And then if you have even weirder objects, the transits will look even weirder. So to give you a little bit of background on this project, up until this point, um, Emery and Daniel have worked on an anomaly detection pipeline that cluster that uses a clustering ML to rank um, all of the test light curves in their database by an anomaly score. And so they got a bunch of candidates um, that are very anomalous, and that includes a lot of transit-like signals. But up until this point, they're really not sure what a megastructure would look like. So my job is to do an injection and recovery that um, injects uh, megastructure signals into light curves and then puts those into the anomaly detection pipeline and finds out where they would have popped out. And then I've been working on doing heat map generation also to, uh, of the injection and recoveries to estimate the probability that we'll be catching megastructures. So the first step was to do light curve generation. So that can, that's across three different parameters. So uh, the transits can be different depths depending on the size of the megastructure, different widths depending on how fast the structures are moving. And that can even fall into the data gap that test has in almost all of its data. And the injections can be made at different times. So what I did is generate heat maps that look like this, where the width of the transit is on the y-axis and the depth of the transit is on the x-axis. And the most detectable um, objects are the yellow ones, at least are purple. So the most detectable objects are the ones that are the widest and deepest, which is what we would have expected. So our metric for detectability is that um, the re relative anomaly rank um, for the light curves is between one and 80,000. And the average uh, of the, ex uh, the extrema of the flux is below the median. So basically, we're looking for transiting signals rather than flare signals. And so just to recap, in each cell, I've injected the transits of that certain width and depth at, different, at 10 different times in the light curve and repeated that for 10 different test light curves within that magnitude bin that are within the middle 50% of uh, anomaly scores. So we're not trying to inject into the most or least anomalous light curves. So here, all of these heat maps have the same axes as the ones I just showed you. And the point that I'm trying to show is that these are the brightest stars over here, MagBin 5, and the dimmest are MagBin 14. So as stars get brighter, 
there's less noise in those signals. And so you're able to make more detections. So we also wanted to run this test on um, like random shapes. So if the megastructures look something like these, and what we found is that the uh, heat maps will look something like this. And there's currently a limitation of my model that it doesn't go below about like 3% transits. But the part that we're interested in anyway is more this region. And they're very comparable to like symmetrical shapes like squares. Um, so future work that we want to do is to investigate what um, anomaly scores would be uh, gotten for multiple transiting objects, such as panels or Dyson swarms. And um, to continue, we're combing through the test data and looking for megastructure signatures among the anomalies. And then eventually to do a numerical estimation of the number of megastructures that might exist. So to basically get an upper limit of the megastructures that we can currently detect based on heat maps. Thank you. Go back to the slide. Sure. I noticed that in the uh, the random shapes for the uh, 19, 14, 15, there's like a little weird where like it's, it's more detectable when it's narrower. For... Oh, this one? Yeah. Is, do you have any explanation for that? Or would you only sort of... um, I don't have an explanation for that. I have a feeling that it's just a result of a small sample size since we're only injecting into 10 different light curves. That's my best guess. Okay, we have one other speaker who had some uh, technical challenges earlier, but now has been able to join us. So, um, Giovanni, uh, it's over to you. Oh, okay, I forgot my my microphone uh, off. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you very much for your uh, for your patience. Uh, unfortunately, I, unfortunately, I had some problems. Uh, well, at first, I want to thank uh, uh, Martin Seika, uh, Matteo Trudu, also Vishal, that uh, and and uh, and Maura Maura Pilia, which uh, had uh, uh, had followed this thing uh, since the very first. Uh, since the very beginning, also because we didn't know at first uh, how to put this uh, project on uh, and so on. And also I want to thank Andrea Melis and uh, uh, of course, Steve Proft for uh, for uh, for everything. In particular, Martin and Matteo, because uh, many of the codes that uh, you will see here in this presentations, in this presentation uh, are uh, are heavily, I, I got uh, much help from them for, 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 for write, writing them. So the, the topic is the use of QLT in the search of extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, we used this first algorithm in which we it just did the job, okay? So it just applied the QLT, which is an a very powerful instrument that uh, we can use for uh, compressing, to for re reducing the, the dimensions of, of the data matrices. Uh, we implement it uh, building the top leads matrix. And uh, we do this uh, by uh, calculating the eigen spectrum, the eigen vectors, uh, and then uh, reconstructing uh, the signal through the um, correlation matrix. We used this algorithm uh, just on uh, Collab notebooks. And uh, in a few moments, I'll tell you why. Because uh, uh, at the very beginning, uh, well, we put it on this sample file, which is uh, about, uh, it was applied on uh, an FRB, uh, just a 1.6 megabyte file. So nothing so particular, no, not, so, not so big. And we can see, we can clearly see that the RFIs, the radio frequency inter interferences, were the, 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 the heaviest one, were uh, greatly removed by just using uh, the first nine eigenvalues of the eigenspectrum. And here we can see uh, the band pass, so at the uh, correspond corresponding uh, frequencies of those two uh, RFIs. So we see the complete, uh, it's completely uh, removed. So uh, where is the problem with this thing? Problem with this thing is that uh, it, uh, did, it did the job just on the whole matrix itself. So uh, going to use it with nearly five gigabytes 
of each filter bank data uh, produced by Sardinia Radio Telescope, we got some troubles, okay? So uh, at, this, at that point, we had to uh, rethink the, 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 the code and to divide the, uh, the, the processing uh, into smaller blocks of the matrix and then to resemble everything. So the final algorithm it is this one with some uh, editors on the on the on the on the final Python script. Yeah. But this is the function that we are using. So we just have uh, the the classic calculation of the eigen spectrum and the eigen vectors, and then we have the the, the KLT function in which we calculate the uh, correlation matrix. Uh, in this case, we don't choose the number of, uh, of, uh, of eigenvalues that we use uh, directly, but we uh, directly use the threshold. So just uh, we, we use the threshold between the signal of interest and the noise because the data that we get in the matrix uh, is composed by both noise and uh, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and sing signal of interest, which is the one that we are looking for. And this is the results. So uh, here we can see before the KLT some data from SRT, which are uh, about the FRB 180916 in uh, three, three several in three different bands. Uh, then we have the uh, the Lorimer past, which uh, made some uh, I don't know how to say that. Well, some uh, some troubles. Okay, it uh, was. Uh, um, particular thing because uh, also with uh, Evan we talked about that uh, because uh, here we can see these uh, RFIs uh, which have uh, a comparable um, power as uh, of as the one uh, of the signal of interest. Nevertheless, the result uh, is uh, this one after the calculation of the KLT. So we can see that uh, the signal of the FRB is uh, clearly, uh, it's heavily cleared just by using that 0 0.4 um, uh, threshold. And the Rolimer burst has this uh, problem and also a small spike that uh, I, well, I don't know if you see that uh, nearly at uh, um, the fourth uh, frequency, frequency channel next to the to the signal of interest but it is in this case what happened was that the power of the of the, the intensity of the signal of interest was uh, similar to the one of the RFIs so this led us to think uh, to rethink of the KLT uh, algorithm that well we have to look at each file really because uh, the risk of deleting some signal of interest is very high so this is one option, or the other one is to put a lower threshold in order to remove uh, less uh, less uh, less information from the from the thing. At this point, we get in trouble because we applied the KLT on several files. In particular, we got two targets: one from the Galactic Survey, Galactic Center Survey, and one from to the to um to YC uh, objects in two different bands. Uh, these are the data for the C band. We also have the data for the key band and uh, uh, the same for the galactic center nuclei. The pro uh, survey. The problem is that, uh, as, is, as you can clearly see, we get uh, a number of, uh, uh, of strikes in the accounts uh, applying the Turbo City. I'm just getting the number of lines from the dead files, uh, as Vishal uh, suggested me. And uh, we can see that uh, uh, it's much higher after the KLT. And also by remove, uh, and well, this made some problems for us. Well, we thought about some solutions uh, and we, 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 we found out that the uh, option for removing the DC spikes uh, isn't enabled by default uh, using the command line interface. Uh, but even after forcing it, we get uh, a number of uh, spikes that's too much high. So this, this was a, a, a great problem and uh, uh, we, we still don't know how to solve that. Also by applying some, some remove spike uh, Python uh, uh, scripts and, uh, and, and so on. Later, uh, yeah, there were some questions. There was some question. Go ahead. Okay, now I was just uh, finishing with this thing because, uh, well, Vishal told us that uh, it would be interesting to do some trials uh, of the KLT calculation with uh, um, the injection of uh, some uh, uh, SETI signal. 
So we made some trials with Cetigen, and this is uh, an example of what we got. So by applying to the same FRB uh, as the previous one, uh, the, the, the Cetigen, and then applying the, the KLT calculation, this is what we get. So it's very interesting, uh, the fact that uh, the uh, resulting reconstructed signal is very clear, and we can clearly see the, the signal of interest that we need for uh, for our purposes. So which are the conclusions of this, uh, of, my, of my study, as we can say that, if we can say that? Well, uh, the thing is that so the KLT is, uh, uh, of course, a great uh, instrument for uh, cleaning the data from uh, noise, OK? But there are some cases in which uh, uh, this cleaning is too much hard. We, we really uh, have to check uh, case for each case, uh, how much it is cleaned, uh, as, as we have seen uh, with uh, the Lorimer Burst example. But I'm told that uh, this problem of the generation of more spikes, uh, well, this, this is a great, a, a huge problem that we are still uh, thinking about, uh, thinking on how to solve that. Uh, and. Uh, uh maybe in the future this is uh, one thing from which we can start uh and also the capability the the, the chance to use the klt uh, in city not only with turbo city but also applying some uh, machine learning uh methods in order to uh make uh, the process uh, way more efficient uh, the process of cleaning but uh, of course, this is the hugest problem. The fact that uh, there are these, uh, these spikes uh, that uh, even uh, if I enable the output uh, DC option, or uh, I, we, we are still trying to figure out how it's, uh, wh why it's this way. So this is, that's it. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Giovanni. Any questions? Yeah, are there any questions? So I'm I'm curious. Um, you know, there've been some earlier talks. I don't know whether you you caught them about kind of some of the other methods using kurtosis specifically um, to 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 do detections. Have you kind of compared this at all with um, the kurtosis based methods? Can you can you repeat the question, please? Have you compared the KLT method with methods based on kurtosis um, for detecting signals? Uh, no, I haven't done this thing. Um, just because uh, we had um, several problems, several troubles with uh, the with the dependencies uh, uh, of. Um, the cond environment inside the SRT data center network. We uh, had some struggle with the um, management of filter bank files. And uh, this, this was because there were two versions uh, of SIG by Brock inside the server. So we had to manage it in some way, really. And in that case, the help of Martin was uh, great because, uh, well, we didn't figure out it uh, very much. So I think that. A week or two have been uh, on this problem, really. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, thanks again, everybody, to all the presenters. I know it's been uh, kind of a mammoth uh, session this morning, and it's been, um, you know, in some ways, kind of a, a long slog during the summer, and in other ways, it seems like the summer's gone by really quickly, um, but we really appreciate everybody uh, taking part, uh, all the effort that you put in this summer. Again, thanks to our sponsors, the Breakthrough Initiatives and the, the National Science Foundation. And uh, I'll post the, um, the the recording of the, these talks online so that you can uh, revisit anything and, and follow up again with folks on Slack if, if you're interested, if you have any other questions. But um, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Hope you have a great, great weekend and uh, enjoy the rest of the summer. Thanks.